Hello. Hi. Hi, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Sir, can you try to share anything? Yes, I will. One second. Okay, can you see my screen? Hello. Yes, sir. Clearly visible. Okay, awesome. Okay, let me let me also start video. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Yep, can you see it? One minute, sir. Yes, sir, we can see your video. We can see. Yes, yes, clearly. Okay, yes. so I'll just stay on. Yes, sir. So just two minutes, we will uh, go live now. Uh, we are setting up the meeting link. Sounds good, okay. Thank you. Last <laughs>
have a degree in maths and statistics. Okay, everyone will not have a degree in maths. But it doesn't prevent you going and taking maybe normal course on statistics, one year course on statistics, or maybe you go get more parts of your MBA, or parts of your academic course. Associate Professor, Department of Computer Science and Application, welcome you to day two of International Conference, MIST 2020. The fluidity of your thoughts is based on flexibility of your belief and the boundaries are set around them. These words hold true for our dynamic resource person, Mr. Satya Jena. Mr. Satya Jena is currently working as Senior Director, Cloud Commerce Product Management, VMware USA. Our distinguished guest, Mr. Satya Jena, is a product management leader, entrepreneur, and a startup advisor with extensive experience in defining and delivering cloud monetization capabilities. Prior to this, Mr. Satya Jena was a co founder and fashion technology startup. He has held various positions at multiple Silicon Valley technology companies, including Cisco, Sun Microsystems, or Apple. Mr. Satyajana is an MBA in Corporate Entrepreneurship, Marketing and General Management from the Franklin Olin School of Business at Babson College. I welcome you, sir, and request you to share your knowledge and experience on cloud technology, multi-cloud model and monetization. I request all the participants to post the questions in the chat box, which will be answered at the end of the technical talk. Over to you, sir. All right, thank you. So before I start, I see yeah. a few mics that are um, in on mute. If you don't mind just muting all because we're getting a lot of background. Okay, much better now. I, I see um, Umesh HR, if you don't mind just muting your mic. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and get started, but I'm still hearing uh, somebody else presenting something, probably a topic. So if you're not talking at all, then just go and mute. You can always do star six to unmute. Um, as was told, uh, you can put your questions in the chat uh, window, which will be a lot more easier for us to you know read it and answer as appropriate. Okay. So uh, first of all, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Shichil, for having me uh, with you today. Um, um, you know, I don't know what you all are expecting, uh, so I'm going in a bit blind. Um, I'm going to make uh, a good attempt to take you through some of the material that I put together. Hopefully, it's going to be relevant for you. Um, and then uh, I think we have been given about 45 minutes. Um, I would like to uh, speak to uh, the topics for about 30 or so minutes, and then we can uh, keep 15 for Q&A, uh, which I think is very important uh, because if I just read through a, about 16 or 17 slides quickly, um, you would not be able to take anything away that, that you can really put into work you know, as you go through your you know, first year, second year, third year, or whatever you are, and then you know, go to the real life. So my intent would be uh, you know, to, to have you, um, um, you know, take three things from this. Uh, first one, is to understand the concepts, uh, which is very important. Um, you know, you can always YouTube and uh, see a whole bunch of stuff on architecture. You know, how the you know modern cloud architecture is done. You know, what are the variants? There's so many 
open sources. There are so many companies around. You can do all of that. I'm not going to focus on those aspects today. I'll speak to the core concept. The second one, I'll talk about how uh, cloud architecture and the evolution of that um, is uh, useful okay, in, a, in a practical sense. Right? Uh, let's, let's definitely have a Q&A on that front. And lastly, um, I'll talk about a few use cases. And then you know, one of the key takeaways for you all students is to understand the concept and then figure out a way to contribute to this. Because at the end of the day, you, know, you, you are either a developer or a product manager you know, or an IT admin or whatever you do in the technology area. Um, and if you want to be as part of the you know, cloud evolution in the industry, um, then take some things away. And that way you can you know, calibrate what you want to do if you're in fourth year or earlier uh, you know, to build your resume accordingly that you can land a job. Okay, so, so those will be the three key takeaways. Uh, from an agenda standpoint, I'll talk a little bit about uh, cloud technology evolution, what, what it started and what is headed and where we expect this to go. Um, I'll touch on you know, what it really means when you talk about modern cloud architecture. Uh, then I'm going to switch gears and go into VMware. I work for VMware, as was told, and VMware's evolution through this journey from you know, one uh, product, uh, you know, which is a hypervisor, to what VMware is doing in regards to uh, multi-cloud and modern cloud. And then we'll talk about a few use cases. Then um, I'll take you through uh, three basic principles of uh, you know, modern app framework for development. Okay, so build, run, manage. So just you just may have to buy out those because those are going to be essential if you want to go in as a developer and work on uh, a cloud infrastructure or for a cloud company. Okay, so uh, let me see. Let me just time myself. Uh, Eleven seven. Okay, my time. Sorry, I'm, I'm in San Jose. So uh, before we get into uh, the whole cloud architecture, I think it's just a level set. This is level set from you know, what we are used to um, as industries and we, what we have been used to for years in the industry. And uh, you know, by, by that, I mean, what do you mean by data centers, right? There's so many companies in the world uh, who have been uh, operating uh, in a traditional way for many, many years, and they have been super successful uh, in regards to running their own data centers, uh, which also is called private cloud in the cloud um, in, a, in a construct. If, you, if you're worried about companies like Cisco, uh, HP, or HCL for that matter, there are so many Indian companies that are in the private data center, which is uh, if I'm a medical device company and I want to be able to run my infrastructure where I have got full control on, then I want that to be hosted um, on premises, meaning I have full control on my data center. Now, data center has many components. You know, it's a box um, with uh, hardware and software on top of that, and many wires running, right? So you'll have seen it. Maybe you have to run it in your college. The three three key um, underpinnings of any data center are compute, storage, and networking. That's it. That's really are the atomic level elements of a data center, which is how do I run my my CPU? Uh, you know, what's my processor? You um, know, speed size. What's my my storage? Uh, whether it's a uh, you know, central storage or federated storage, and you know, what are my networking capabilities? You know, whether I run hardware or I, so I do software-defined storage, right? So as you put it all together, and then you know, you know, if you're an IT admin, you will be, um, you'll require an ability to see what's happening. If you have a bunch of CPUs running, you have storage sitting there, uh, you know, you have networking failure, right? So you would want uh, a way to visualize and manage it in you know, what we call automation and operations, which is look, um, you know, I've got six servers sitting out of that. I only see four servers that are getting activated, you know, on, on, a, on a specific time of the day. Meaning there's something going on with my two servers, right? Maybe there, maybe there's a network issue. How do I predict that I'm running out of storage, right? So, so that's the wrapper on top of these three foundational, um, you know, elements of a private uh, data center or private cloud. So that's step number one. And a lot of companies have been on this uh, for many, many years. Uh, they are still on this, and they'll continue to be on this for various reasons. So as I flip through uh, some of the other slides, there, there are four things um, I would want you all to keep in mind um, you know, as, a, as anchor points. Uh, you know, those are uh, cost, uh, um, scale, uh, flexibility, and security. Okay, it doesn't matter where you are. Those uh, four things really matter uh, for any company, which is, uh, you know, am I expensive running a private data center or I should be, um, you know, switching to a public data center? If I do that, then what happens to my scale? If I have 10 employees now, 
and all of a sudden I had a killer product and I'm going to jump jump to thousand employees. So I'm able to scale up. What are my security um, you know, concerns? If I'm a you know, government agency, uh, data needs to be secure. Are there any 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 holes, right, from a security standpoint? And what are my uh, you know what are my uh, flexibility um, elements? Meaning, you know, I don't want to pay a lot of money right now if you want to run a data center uh, that may not be used after a month. Let's talk about a seasonal company. If you uh, if you uh, look at Flipkart, right? So they they go through seasons. So I, you know, when there's a there's a holiday season, you know, they have a spike. When it's, it's not a holiday season, it's not a spike. So this hardware just sits there. So keep keep those four elements in mind. I'm going to quickly go through the next three or four slides just to relate to these three underpinnings and those four parameters, and then you can talk about how it all comes together. Okay. Now switching from that uh, to a public cloud, uh, again the same concept. There's complete storage and networking. It's just that it is not running on, uh, on, a, on a customer premise, uh, but it is hosted um, on, on a third party um, in a cloud infrastructure, right? There's so many cloud infrastructures today, and what that means is you don't have to worry about you know buying your hardware, buying your software, you know running it, employing people to run it, uh, you know troubleshoot it. That's all somebody else's problem. So if that that's not your headache. You give it a third-party vendor like AWS. Let AWS manage the whole thing for you, and then you can run a whole bunch of stuff uh, on a public cloud. You know you can run your databases, right? You can run your web servers, app servers, everything that you could possibly do on-prem. You can do it on on hosted as well. Okay, so if you use again those four parameters, um, you know, for uh, you know for a public um, you know cloud you know for a scenario, uh, your cost uh, generally is low, okay, because your upfront cost is nothing because you are literally not uh, buying anything. There's no hardware, no installation, nothing. So upfront uh, upfront cost cost goes down. From a scale standpoint, uh, because you are not constrained by the, the amount of hardware you bought, or the amount of uh, you know processors you have there. Uh, as, as long as you're paying uh, money to, let's say, to AWS on a subscription basis, which is generally, and I'm going to pay you for a month, like a phone bill, right? I can go up and down. So it doesn't really matter, right? So, uh, you know, for me, um, you know, I'm probably paying a bit of premium, but I have somebody else taking care of business for me. The third one is uh, is uh, flexibility. Uh, now I can have, uh, you know, peak uh, whenever there's a holiday season for which, um, you know, I, I have a pre uh, prepaid for, storage computer networking, then I get a rate. If I go over that, there's a concept called on-demand, uh, which is you know, if I'm paying $5 uh, for CPU per hour, um, you know, on-demand is maybe $10. However, I'm just paying it for the season, and after the season is done, then I'm not paying it anymore, right? And then security-wise, because these big companies manage their infrastructure for many, many customers, right? You know, if, if their infrastructure goes down, then everything goes on. You can't watch Netflix. Netflix runs on AWS. You know, you, you cannot literally do anything, um, you know, no e-commerce activities, um, cannot do any streaming, et cetera, right? So they have, they have hyper security focus. They are hyper reliability focused. So you, you pass on the burden to uh, the hosted services, so you don't have to worry about it. However, um, you know, even though it, it may sound very lucrative, uh, but depending on the situation, um, if you do what they call uh, a TCO uh, or a total cost of ownership, um, and your usage pattern, you know, there are you know, instances where I've seen that, uh, you know, private data centers um, and the companies that have private data centers who are moved to public have actually incurred more cost. You know, I'll, I'll talk about it as to why that happens. And hence, you know, uh, the next set of the evolution addresses some of those concerns. So the third variety, uh, the, you know, these are some examples, right? There, these are the big, uh, you know, big players in, in the marketplace, uh, AWS, um, Azure from Microsoft and uh, Google Cloud. Then there is Oracle Cloud, there's IBM Cloud, there's Alibaba Cloud. So uh, those five really are the you know big cloud providers today that are available. And there's so many smaller players, but those are the ones where most of the corporate workloads run today. Okay, go to the next one. Uh, so we talked about private, we talked about public, and then we're talking about hybrid. So what is hybrid? Uh, you know, because of the elements I talked about, which is cost, scalability, flexibility, and security. And a lot of company, companies are right in the middle of uh, whether, you know, look, I don't know whether I want to move or not because it's a, it's a very cumbersome process to, um, you know, move my you know, private data center to a public data center. Um, you know, I'm, let's say I'm a financial company. I, I don't feel comfortable uh, putting all of my financial info on a public infrastructure, let's say AWS. What, what if there's a hack? And, you know, they're having so many instances. I want to keep some on-prem 
but at the same time, I want the ability to be able to move workload. You know, you know, let's say I have an on-premise data center, a data center is running, and I also have my workload hosted on, as an example, AWS or Google Cloud. Um, and then, you know, I'm going to run the non-critical, let's say, applications um, on, on Google Cloud. Um, and then I'm running all the critical applications in the private data center. But if I'm a network admin, uh, then it's, it's, it's double the work for me because I'm, you know, before I was managing what I had on my private data center, now I have to manage uh, what I have in the public data center. And the architectures are oftentimes very different, right? And in a private data center, you could, um, you know, if you go with Cisco gear, Cisco works one way. If you go with HP gear, HP works differently. Uh, but then if you work, uh, if you put your, um, uh, you know, workload on AWS, AWS has a very different um, infrastructure. So it gets very, very complicated very quickly. And then uh, at the end of the day, uh, you would end up spending more money as opposed to saving money, okay? And then, you know, if you look at, uh, let's say your college, I don't know how many branches you have, but if you look at a company, the company is set up um, in, um, in metros, but these days, um, you, you know, with COVID um, and other scenarios, they do have a lot of branch offices. So what we have determined is that architecturally, if you, uh, let's say if Cisco San Jose is the corporate headquarter and there's a data center. Uh, Cisco Bangalore is the Eastern Zone headquarter. There's a data center. However, uh, Cisco Africa, you know, Cisco Netherlands, you know, they may not have data centers. Okay, so if they're running in a private um, sense and let's say they have some workload running in AWS, uh, there's a lot of latency. This is a huge um, you know, amount of latency um, uh, that we've seen. So. Uh, you know that that led us led us we need the industry to introduce uh, a concept called edge uh, you know which um, which has something called sd1 software defined wide data network uh, meaning um, you know you can have your corporate you know corporate data center uh, corporate data centers you can you can have your uh, workload uh, run on public cloud but for the branch offices you can actually improve latency by by installing edge routers okay now if you do do all these three things, um, then I'm, I'm a network admin, uh, you know, working for a medical company, and I've got to manage all of this. So for that, again, it requires automation and operations. That, that specific line on the top, that's an industry by itself. It will look very simple pictorially. However, there are a lot of complications in this, and I'll talk about those. And you know, I'll also talk about what, what are the remedies um, to ensure that um, as you sort of live in this very heterogeneous uh, environment of, uh, a variety of architectures, um, you know, some, um, you know, some that are up the shelf, some are built, um, you know, some are moved. How can I manage all of this together? Okay, so that's that's hybrid, um, and then we go into um, the the latest or the, the most recent uh, journey um, in cloud, uh, which is called multi-cloud and also called modern cloud. So it, again, for for the above regions, I talked about cost, scalability, flexibility, and uh, and security. Um, you know, companies have got to kind of smarter. Before, um, when I say before, five years ago, probably five, four to five years ago, uh, the early adopters of, um, you know, of companies who wanted to move workload from private to public, um, you know, probably had a bunch of private data centers, uh, uh, you know, on-prem, and then maybe had one uh, or, you know, one or so uh, public data centers, meaning, you know, working with AWS. Uh, so they will move all of their workload to AWS, uh, but I don't know how many of you have uh, written code, uh, code or deployed code uh, on AWS. Um, you know they have free services. Uh, that doesn't really matter for individual developers or you know business to um, commerce customers. But uh, for business to business, uh, AWS is a very very expensive affair. Their rates are pretty high. They, they they charge a premium because they provide premium service. So what companies figured out is, look, I don't want to be paying a premium for you know, everything I'm doing uh, that probably doesn't require a premium service. Examples could be if you're a gaming company, um, you know, I am running, let's say, um, you know, high CPU intensive um, you know, gaming simulations. For that, I need, to be, I need to be dependent on CPU power, meaning compute power. So among the five uh, infrastructures I talked about, you know, Google, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, uh, you know, Oracle, Alibaba, I'm just going to shop around. I'm going to say, look, hey, um, I think IBM is giving me a better price for compute. But if I just have to uh, store my files, um, you know, let's say I have a Microsoft account uh, and I just need storage, then I'm like, look, uh, Microsoft is giving me a better price because I have the entire office suite and I'm going to just you know, dump all of my, uh, my folders uh, on, on the Microsoft. 
And then you talk about, okay, well, Google has got better, better analytical capabilities. So maybe I, I run some workload in Google. So you see the pattern, private to public to hybrid. Now hybrid has gone into multitude of, um, you know, what we call native public clouds. And every single public cloud has its own, uh, own architecture. So that just, if you just extrapolate the scenario, right, the, comp you know, the complexity sort of, um, you know, uh, goes exponentially. So, you know, it all, again, it all looks pretty simple on, on a page, but if I'm a developer or I'm an IT admin, I'm having to manage private, I'm having to manage uh, so many public, I'm having to manage edge, I'm, I'm lost. I'm like, look, I don't think I can do with this. This on the paper looks pretty good, but I don't think um, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's usable uh, in, in a real life scenario. So that's really are the challenges, uh, our set of challenges um, that companies are facing today. And hence, uh, cloud is a you know a concept uh, which was coined probably um, I don't know 20 years ago. Uh, the concept has been around for probably 40 years, mainframe days. Uh, but the adoption wise, it was very slow. I mean, the first 10 years, um, there are a lot of startups that came in and failed miserably, and there are a lot of startups who uh, you know came in and um, really started um, using a very simplified version of cloud. If, if you talk about Salesforce.com. They're probably one of the pioneers uh, in cloud computing, uh, but I, I, you know, as I say, under the hood, they're a very simple cloud provider. I mean, there's nothing that a modern cloud infrastructure would provide that Salesforce does. For Salesforce, you pay money and you use it, and that's about it. You pay money for a seat, and that's it. It doesn't have you know worse capacity or capacity going down or any of the scenarios, which is what what is required in today's world. Okay, I just want to give an you know I, I can't really. Tell you what the customer is. Um, this is a real life scenario. Um, you, you know, if, for a customer, they have got four data centers right across the globe, and then they got a whole bunch of uh, uh, you know cloud partners they're working with. Okay, so these are cloud partners, and they're also working with Edge, and their applications running all over the place, right? And uh, if I am an employee of that company, and um, you know, let's say I'm based out of uh, 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 Netherlands, I'm moving to the US or India, you know, you know everything is to be seamless, right? Everything should work for me and my workload should be, I should have no latency. So managing all of this is, is a real challenge. So, so this is really what's under this is the architecture. How do you make sure that my, my plumbing, meaning my piping is all good, everything is connected, you know, I'm able to run my workload, I'm able to scale down and scale up, and I'm able to run my critical applications with, um, you know, um, you know, with the 99.9% .9 uptime. That way, my business is not getting impacted. Okay, so that's that's the first part, and um, and the second part, uh, I'm just going to take it down, which is, uh, you know, some of the points I highlighted. Right, if you if you put these things together, um, it's it's highly complicated. Um, you know, operational inconsistencies. I just talked about it. There was, was there a question? Current applications, but. Hello? Okay, I'm just gonna ignore that. that. I think I thought there was a question, but I'm not gonna ignore that. I think somebody was talking on the side. So, um, you know, operational inconsistencies, uh, inconsistencies uh, there are different um, types of tools, um, you know, that are required um, and skill sets that are required. Because like I said, you know, Microsoft will run on Microsoft technology, Google runs on mostly on, uh, um, you know, on Google uh, proprietary technology, and there are some off-the-shelf uh, products, and, and there are disparate management tools and security controls. You know, you 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 know, if you look at uh, the security protocols, every cloud has its own security protocol. That you know, then the question becomes, how do I keep it all together in a consistent way? How do I manage my SLAs, uh, you know, service level agreements? Because every cloud may have a different service level agreement. If I'm running applications, um, I always go by the lowest uh, in the uptime. If uh, you know one app is running at 99%, 99.99% uptime, and one is running at 80%, then uh, you know from a reliability standpoint, I cannot say it's 9%, 99.99. 9, it is always 80%, right? And then um, uh, their their mission format is the last one, which is everybody has a different way of uh, really sort of storing and um, you know uh, managing uh, different information. So this is really where a company like VMware comes in. Um, um, you know, um, I'll quickly talk about um, VMware's evolution. Uh, then we'll jump into uh, you know how VMware is uh, you know contributing uh, to the cloud evolution overall. Uh, so VMware um, 
you know, if I tell you a one minute or less story, because I can go on for an hour on this, um, you know, there's a lot of history to VMware. It actually started at Stanford University as, as a lab project, uh, you know, back in the 90s, 98, I think, uh, by a lady called Diane Green. Um, you know, they were experimenting with uh, the concept of, look, um, you know, in a private data center, if I have a machine, um, and uh, you know, back in the days, you could only have one operating system run on the machine, okay? If I have, um, you know, X amount of compute, X amount of storage and, uh, and networking in there, and if I'm running just Windows server on that, and my Windows server is not being used at all, then, that, then the machine just sits. The hardware is just not used at all. And that turns out to be super expensive. So VMware came with a concept, which is a hypervisor, which is, look, I'm gonna put a layer of abstraction on top of your hardware and your operating system, wherein you can actually run more than one operating system on a specific hardware configuration. In other words, if I had a machine, I can run Windows, I can run Linux, I can run in a Sco Unix, or I can run any other operating system. So that was a big, big uh, you know, cost savings, uh, um, I would say a breakthrough technology that VMware came up with, one product, went on, you know, then um, you know, from that to they came up with a bunch of other products in the infrastructure area, but as, as the industry is moving to public cloud, uh, we started investing in the public cloud, and then we started investing in edge uh, networking. You know, it was, a, it was products that are either built within VMware or companies that are acquired. We signed a partnership with AWS and the journey continues, right? So from a technology standpoint, um, you know, like I just mentioned, uh, the hypervisor you know, is what it started. And then, uh, then there was a control plane that was introduced called vSphere, which is how do I manage so many hypervisors, even if I'm in a private data center. Then, then came software defined data center, which is you know taking it up, up a level, you know, adding networking, uh, which is called uh, um, FDN software defined network, that virtual storage network, right? So the package got bigger, and then it went into hybrid cloud, right? So that that's been VMware's journey so far. Um, again, very relatable to where the industry started and where the industry is going. So the goal of VMware is that uh, you, know, you know one should be able to run. Um, any device, uh, you know, whether it's mobile device, um, you know, or uh, your uh, you know, company device, or, or your, your personal devices, in a very seamless fashion. And uh, whether it's running on private data center, or it's running on uh, you know, public data centers, um, on multi-cloud, or it, you're just running um, simple um, as a service applications, right? How can you package it all together, okay, and that way you have a seamless experience, not only from a user standpoint, but from a network admin standpoint, from a developer standpoint, to manage your super you know, disparate, you know, uh, and heterogeneous federated model in a consistent way. Okay, which which happens to be the underpinning for digital transformation, which is a term you know being used uh, very much. But that's really what it really means uh, if you were to um, you know decipher that uh, to a technical language. Okay, so here's another example uh, for our, our VMware um, hybrid cloud. Um, you know, there's this public cloud running, you know, the started private, right? This is private cloud, you know, compute storage network, uh, you know, it's running there. The public cloud infrastructures, um, you know, um, where a customer can move workload between private and public, and then the edge network as well. So it, it provides a diverse set of clouds, uh, you know, whether, you know, if I'm a developer, I don't really care. I'm running on, off, or multi. I have the same experience, okay? I have the same process, I have the same tools, and I have the same SLA, I have the same operational capabilities. Okay, so here are some of the, um, uh, you know, real life use cases um, for, um, you know, cloud generally speaking, but, you know, VMware specifically, uh, what does it mean, really mean, right? For customers, it provides them the ability to migrate to the cloud. Uh, the scenarios are app migration, I'm running, um, let's say, um, you know, um, my HR application on-prem, I want to move my HR application to cloud, right? The data center consolidation, which is I'm running 10 different data centers, um, but I don't need those because I'm already running workload on public cloud. So can I consolidate it down to two or three and save money? Right? Data center migration, many companies have been running data centers for years, like banks, for example, they, they are very risk averse. They run you know, on the same infrastructure for many decades. So this provides them the ability to move. And then cloud to cloud migration. So if I'm running on something on, on let's say AWS, and then I realize that I'm paying more money, I need to move to GCP. How can I do that? Scale on demand. I talked. I, 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 I touched on this. Um, you know, which is uh, you know, what's my disaster recovery uh, mechanism? You know, you know, if there is a COVID, 
if uh, there's a flooding, there was a lot of flooding last two years ago, um, you know, in data centers in Taiwan um, and in that region, um, right? So then you immediately have a backup data center. If I want to expand my business in a region, what do I do with that? My, my signal and cyclical capacity or my, my burst capacity, how can I scale up and scale down? For, uh, from uh, a multi-cloud operation standpoint, you know, how can I, I can run that, that layer of single uh, pane glass? Uh, what is my, uh, you know, what are my hybrid operational capabilities? How can I apply governance and compliance? Uh, I don't know, you probably don't know, things like GDPR, SCO, uh, and SEO, uh, you know, ISO 9000, right? Those kind of things, I'm gonna run those for, uh, for specific verticals like government or uh, pharmaceutical industries, they are, um, or defense industries that have their own ways of running things, and then operating costs. The last one I think is relevant for you. If you remember what I said very early on, you know, one of the, takeaways, which is what really happens if I'm a developer, right? I'm able to develop, um, you know, apps in a cloud native way, meaning I'm directly writing code into um, into AWS or a BCP. Um, I'm able to manage my app operations. I'm able to test and develop and deploy. Like if you can, if I'm developing code, uh, let's say on AWS, uh, then uh, you know, on using Kubernetes as my underlying platform, then I can put that in a container and move that to GCP. I can do that, right? Seamlessly. And then you know you can um, also scale up and down and develop the resources because if you level the playing field, uh, then you get a lot of resources uh, who have uh, the knowledge, right? Instead of uh, you know somebody who is like completely archaic because data center was built 30 years ago, and this gentleman who is 70 years old knows the code. That's it. I mean, this is this is no longer true. Anybody can come in, learn the language uh, that's available, um, can actually work on it. And this also extends to many other industry applications using edge. Um, you know. IoT just happens to be a use case, right? It's an overused term, but you know, anywhere you have a you have a signal, right? You can you can pretty much use it. Okay, so uh, how are we doing on time? By the way, I've like two more slides to go. Am I am I doing okay on time? Somebody can somebody acknowledge? Yes, sir. You can continue. Okay, I've got 15 or so minutes. Yes, sir. No problem. Okay. All right, so if I'm a developer, the three things to keep in mind, build, run, and manage, right? How am I able to uh, you know, uh, either build new applications or uh, enhance my existing applications? How am I able to uh, deploy co codes, uh, with, uh, which stands for commercial off-the-shelf uh, applications, or I'm able to build um, you know, cloud native applications, you know, on GCP or, or AWS. So I do that, and then, um, you know, then how am I able to run my applications, right, on-prem or public cloud or on edge? And then finally, um, how am I able to uh, manage my applications, uh, which is you know, using a single, uh, you know, pane of glass uh, across multi-clouds, multi-clusters, and multi-teams. Okay. So if you look at manage, um, and if you want to do read up, if any anybody's really interested to kind of learn the space, I would highly recommend. And reading up uh, material either uh, on vmware.com or microsoft.com or AWS has a lot of material if you want to dig deeper. So I wanted to give an example of uh, you know one of the you know products that we launched two years ago, which is called VMware Tanzu, that provides the manageability of uh, applications. Okay, uh, it's called Tanzu Mission Control, uh, where you can uh, that you can use to deploy, manage, and operate, uh, you know, modern applications that are in containers, right? Kubernetes, in other words, mm -hmm. that can be, uh, you know, built and uh, deployed um, in a multitude of environment, right? So, you know, whether it's multi-cloud or multi-cluster uh, or multi-team, people can actually contribute to this. A set of developers can work on one app and it's it's based on a standard uh, code base, okay? It's it's already, it already has a checks and balances uh, of writing code. You take it, put it in a container and move it around. Okay, so I think I believe that's a, that's the last one. Um, you know, um, on, on on my section, and I, I realized that I went through a lot of material in a very short time. So it obviously is a uh, is an information overload. Uh, but then, as long as you keep the core concepts in mind, which is compute, storage, and networking, and the parameters to look for are cost, uh, scale, um, uh, flexibility, and security. Um, you know, is where uh, you know, cloud is used and applied in real life. I think uh, you know that'll be um, you know I'll be happy uh, in, in in regards to you at least benefiting from the last thirty minutes. Okay, so with that, I think we can open it up for questions. If anybody has any questions, whether um, I don't know if you want to unmute 
and ask or put in the chat window, um, and then um, I'll I'll try my best to address. Yes, participants, any questions are there? Participants, any questions? Uh, I have a suggestion. Uh, this is Partha Mohanty. Yes, hi. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, next time around, if you could please show one use case. Just one simple use case, because too much of uh, technical jargons and uh, as you rightly said, too much of information overload. Not right now, but in the next round, if you could show just one simple use case, okay? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, we can. I don't know when the next round is going to be, uh, but I'm happy to uh, take a, a question or walk through a specific use case if you're interested. Uh, here um, are really the use cases. These are the key use cases of uh, what happens in cloud, right? If you want to double click on a specific one, I could do that. Um, or, um, you know, we, we can talk about uh, how this can be accomplished offline. Thank you, Satya. Basically, we work in different domains, different industries. So how best we relate to our domain or industry can come to the forefront if you take us through one use case, and that way we'll be able to relate it back to our domain industry's experience, and we'll be able to do a bit on I. That is the intent, right? Yep, absolutely. No, that's a good question. That's definitely a good question. Any other participants has questions? Yeah. Uh, sir, there is a question in the chat box. How hybrid cloud is more secure than public cloud? Okay, so, you know, hybrid cloud is, um, um, is the next generation of public cloud, okay? So hybrid cloud, like I said, is a is a combination of um, you know a company running a, a workload uh, on premise and then company running workload uh, on the public cloud and the ability to go back and forth within these two clouds, right? So um, I don't think uh, there's anything called how hybrid cloud is secure than public cloud, uh, but security is a big concern uh, when you talk about hybrid cloud, right? If it is public cloud, everything is managed by the public cloud provider. So it's it's isolated to public cloud, meaning if it's AWS, then um, the entire security is managed by AWS. Now let's look at um, a specific uh, use case. Um, you know, I'm running my uh, uh, private data center uh, on premise, and I'm running you know some workload on AWS. So I've got uh, you know, security protocols on both sides, right? And they are working fine, okay, as expected because they're in isolation. But at the same time, when you talk about moving workload, then you're looking at, okay, how can I um, you know, compare uh, you know, my security protocol and uh, you know, make it work together? Okay. Meaning if I do a handoff, if my left hand uh, picks up workload from my private cloud or my private data center, I, I have to somehow you know, move it to my public cloud. So you can do that by VPCs uh, in a virtual private network like, like VPN, right? So that's a mechanism. But that also always has um, exposure to security, because if the handshake is not done proper, then it can leave uh, you know, holes for you know hackers um, to get it. Okay, so that'll be my explanation to you know how security is relevant uh, in the context of hybrid cloud um, as it relates to security working on public cloud. Hope it makes sense. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Participants? Oops, sorry. Thank you, sir. Now I request Mr. Ramkrishna Reddy, sir, to propose vote of thanks. Mm -hmm. The best and beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or even touched. They must be felt by heart. I, Ram Krishna Reddy, it is a great honor and privilege to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of the Oxford College of Science. I would like to thank our today's speaker, Mr. Satya Jana, Senior Director, Cloud Commerce 
Product Management, VMware USA, who graced with his thought-provoking address, set a perfect platform for our college. Sir, your talk on the modern cloud architecture and applications made us to understand the cloud platform concepts very deeply. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I request all the participants to stay online for oral presentations. Uh, the oral presentations will begin now. Yeah. I welcome you all uh, for the oral presentation five. So now this session includes the oral presentation number uh, 66 and above. The uh, feedback form a link uh, will be shared with you after the uh, end of the session. A very good afternoon to one and all present for this particular session. I am Dr. Shlini, Assistant Professor, Department of Biochemistry, Mount Carmel College. I am here to present a short topic titled, A Green Nanobiotechnological Approach for the Synthesis of Copper. To give a brief introduction, nanobiotechnology is one of the emerging fields today having a wide spectrum of applications. As depicted, nanobiotechnology biochemistry along with bioinformatics can lead to a vast therapeutic usages including cancer biology. Looking at the current global scenario, there is a need to switch to sustainable methods of development of nanoparticles, that is green synthesis. In the recent years, among various nanoparticles, copper nanoparticles have gained much attention for the researchers due to its wide application. Copper nanoparticles can be prepared by biological as well as chemical and physical methods. In the present study, Tamarindus indica is used as a plant source for synthesizing copper nanoparticles as it is proved to put, possess potential active ingredients such as antibacterial activity, antiviral, antifungal, anti-inflammatory and many more. We had four major objectives for the study. The first one, processing of tamarind seeds. Second, green synthesis of copper oxide nanoparticles using the tamarind seed extracts. Third, characterization of the copper oxide nanoparticles. Fourth, study of the antibacterial activity of the synthesized nanoparticle. The material that we used for this particular study was tamarindus indica seeds. These are well known for antimicrobial property. The seed also is extremely rich in most of the nutrients such as calcium, magnesium, vitamins and other minerals. But they also have anti-nutritional factors which can be removed by processing like cooking, soaking, or uh, autoclaving and dehulling etc. The methodology that were employed were processing of the tamarind seeds, preparation of the extract that was aqueous extract, synthesis of copper nanoparticles using copper sulfate solution, characterization of the copper nanoparticles by UV spectrometer as well as FTIR, antibacterial assay by well diffusion method. The processing treatments of the seeds that were carried out were soaking, dehulling, cooking and autoclave. To sum up this result in the discussion of the particular study, the synthesis of nanoparticle was proven and confirmed. It is reported that the synthesis of nanoparticles are proved provided the solution containing the plant extract and the copper sulfate solution turns to a blue to the green, green to brown and brown to a black dark colored solution which is exactly what was obtained but of course in different samples a different intensity of the color was observed. Further, the characterization of the CNP was carried out by UV visible spectroscopy wherein most of the samples CNPs showed an absorption peak at 280 and 300 nanometer which further explained, which further indicated the presence of copper nanometer. 
particles. We further went on to characterize them using FTIR. Each of the samples gave a vibrational peak between 600 and 400 as depicted in the five samples which confirm the presence of copper nanoparticles. There appeared sharp peaks at 3500 and 1400 which confirm the presence of single bonds such as NHCH and OHS as well as double bond confirmation was obtained which further clarified the in confirmation of copper nanoparticles. Further, the antibacterial activity of the copper nanoparticle was conducted in three batches. The batch 1 comprised of the study with reference to the volume of copper nanoparticle utilized for inhibition, both with reference to E. coli as well as bacilli. Both in E. coli and bacilli, as, as less as 5 microliters also indicated the inhibition zone in almost all the sample extracts. Further, the volume was further checked with different antibiotics, standard antibiotics against two bacterial species, E. coli as well as bacteria. E. coli as well as bacteria with ciprofloxacin showed a better result than the ciprofloxacin in comparison to that of the CNP. So CNP was much better both in case of inhibiting the E. coli as well as bacilli as it is depicted. Here. We also performed the inhibition with reference to rifampicin and these are the two tables that are depicting the results with reference to the inhibition zones. The extract alone have shown an inhibition. The extract along with the copper oxide that is copper oxide nanoparticle have shown a drastic increase in inhibition but in comparison to the standard antibiotics you see that it is much better. So the standard antibiotics is given as such as 3.5 mm whereas the copper nanoparticle has depicted 6.5 and it is almost increased in all the cases with reference to E. coli as well as bacilli both in case of ciprofloxacin as well as rapamphacin. To conclude, Tamarindus indica plant extract shows improvised antibacterial property when conjugated with copper nanoparticles as compared to plant extract without nanoparticle conjugation. Copper nanoparticle conjugation enhances the antibacterial properties of Tamarindus indica seeds. The test can further be performed for antifungal properties. Conjugation of gold nanoparticles can be done for a better shelf life. It can be studied for further research work at a larger scale. Apart from copper and gold, other metal ions can also be chosen for this study for the efficiency of green synthesis. I would like to acknowledge Anushya and Shweta who worked with, uh, for this particular work. I would also like to thank the college authority, the management, for funding this project and offering the facilities for the analysis. Thank you all for your patience listening. I would like to take up any questions if Hello, uh, good morning. Uh, myself, uh, Dr. Darka Prasad B from uh, uh, BMS Institute of Technology. Uh, the today's topic is on high band gap nanomaterials for effective P type photo anode material for fourth generation solar cells. You know, there is a lot of demand for the uh, energy to meet the needs of the present world. Uh, renewable energy is the next energy where the solar cells and ener uh, the energy is in most demand but presently the efficiency of the solar cells is uh, very less hence there is a need of uh, increasing in the efficiency of the solar cells along with the increase in the efficiency of the solar cells it is better to have a flexibility in the solar cells and then the lightweight for this if we take the silicon based solar cells First thing, the silicon is costly to get the pure silicon which is required for making the solar cells. That silicon material is costly. 
and the second thing is uh, the f there is no flexibility in the solar cells based on silicon so which was the first generation solar cells later on there are a lot of uh, progress in the in making of solar cells among them the fourth generation solar cells if we see there the flexibility is there uh, because of uh, different various materials which are used uh, like the perovskites based solar cells polymer based solar cells disethesized solar cells like this so here in uh, all these fourth generation solar cells there is a need of uh, p type of semiconducting materials so making a p type semiconducting materials where the holes are the majority charge carriers is a lot, require a lot of uh, 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 the engineering uh, with the materials to make them but there are no easy ways to get the p type materials in this way we made an attempt of preparing the zinc oxide nanoparticles uh, using the plant extracts uh, like uh, two of the plant extract which i am going to present here one is uh, neem oil based that is uh, called as azdri chat and indica extract and the other one is glycerin which is a, a chemical compound so both are prepared not by a regular combustion method it is prepared by a ultrasonication followed by combustion method where during the ultrasonication the polymer uh, compounds of these materials like the neem oil those uh, polysaccharides they bind with the uh, protein chains and makes a egg box model so with this egg box model the zinc oxide uh, particles uh, the nanoparticles what they prepare uh, they will get trapped in this egg box model later on with a small heating process the uh, organic compounds they get evaporated leaving behind the content which is required for the uh, uh, next step that is zinc oxide nanoparticles we get it uh, with a uh, superstructures where the surface uh, activity of these samples will be very high so since we are replacing the glycerin with the neem oil which is uh, a plant extract so we are calling this as a green eco friendly method of combustion uh, combustion steps so as i said the zinc oxide nanoparticles are prepared by using uh, the neem oil extract here the mixture of 8.91 gram of zinc nitrate is mixed with 10 ml of uh, neem oil and then 10 ml of distilled water and this compound was stirred for 30 minutes in the magnetic stirrer and then it is subjected to the ultrasonication of uh, frequency 22 kilohertz and at a room a temperature of 353 kelvin after a half an hour of ultrasonication then uh, it is subjected to heat uh, that is we kept it in the muffle furnace which is preheated at 633 uh, kelvin after uh, 20 minutes of uh, this uh, combustion process we will left behind with the zinc oxide nanoparticles the prepared zinc oxide nanoparticles are characterized by powder x-ray diffraction technique scanned electron microscopy edax and then u visible spectroscopy next tg dsc and then the fluorescence studies were carried out later on the material was tested for its uh, nature of semiconducting like is it a p type or here is the xrd pattern so the jspds card number 897102 it matches with both the samples one is prepared by the glycerin the other one is prepared by the neem oil so the v1 it shows a better crystallite size than the green synthesis method so the crystallite size obtained by uh, using neem oil is uh, is about 25 nanometers uh, which is calculated by escherichia formula uh, this xrd pattern was further uh, subjected to the ritual refinement that ritual refinement also it shows the better fitment with the jspds card number 897102 that part of the presentation is not included in this conference page scanning electron microscopy pictures it shows there is a agglomeration but with a sharp edges on the surface 
and then there are a lot of porous uh, nature of the material which helps us in uh, making the thin films of these zinc oxide nanoparticles. So the edax uh, studies shows that there is no impurity in the prepared samples. The atomic weight and the weight percentage of the elements it comes out to be 100% with only the zinc oxide. View visible spectroscopy of the prepared samples it shows the peak at uh, 392 nanometers and then 381 nanometers respectively for B1 and B2 samples. Uh, the energy band gap estimated uh, by wooden top relation it shows the energy band gap of 3.37 EV for V2 sample and 3.4 EV for the V1 sample. Shows that both are in high energy band gap semiconductors nature. The temperature of the uh, prepared samples were fixed with the help of TGA and DSC studies. So the TGA and DSC studies uh, shows there is a weight loss at around uh, 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 it starts from 400 uh, degrees centigrade to up to uh, 780 degrees centigrade. Within that range, we can set the uh, temperature. So we set the temperature, which is at around 500 degrees centigrade uh, during the combustion process. To set the temperature, this TGDSC and then the heat flow of the material was selected. Fluorescence spectroscopy of the prepared samples, it shows that when we excite the material at 380 nanometers, then it has a peaks at uh, 468 nanometer and then 502 nanometers, uh, which confirms that the material it emits a bluish color or a bluish green color emission by the samples. So there is a lot of demand of uh, blue color material. So in that way, this fluorescence study helps that, I mean shows that the prepared material is uh, emitting a color in bluish region. CIE diagram of this also, it confirms the blue region uh, marking for both V1 and V2, but there is a slight difference in their positions, but both are belonging to the bluish green region. All effect uh, uh, studies of the samples were prepared by making this powder sample to a th film form using spin coating unit and then subjected them to the Hall effect studies. So the Hall effect studies it is uh, HEX uh, research mode it is used where we can vary the magnetic field from uh, 1 tesla to uh, 10 uh, tesla. Uh, so resistivity measurement of uh, zinc oxide thin films uh, for different layers of coating it is measured. Uh, it is found that the resistivity of zinc oxide thin films at room temperature is found to be around 10 to the power of 3 ohm centimeter. All effect studies of V1 sample showed a P-type nature of the material and then uh, V2 showed a N-type nature. So in that way the neem oil when we used for the preparing of uh, uh, zinc oxide nanomaterials, that particular uh, zinc oxide nanomaterial which is changed to a p-type because of the displacement in the oxygen ions position which made that one to the p-type material. Hence, uh, we can use this material further for uh, making the uh, solar cells, so that is under progress. In conclusion, zinc oxide nanoparticles were successfully synthesized by neem oil extract and glycerin using ultrasonic combustion method. The structural elemental composition and morphologies were investigated. TXRD studies confirmed the crystalline oocyte structure. From the same analysis, non-uniform surface morphology and agglomeration uh, was observed. From the usual near spectral analysis, energy band gap were calculated and found that uh, the calculated energy band gap for uh, neem oil used uh, compound is 3.37 EV. Fluorescence studies shows uh, samples can be used in white light emitting diodes and optoelectronic devices. Further, the Hall effect studies showed that using neem oil extract, the zinc oxide nanoparticles prepared were in uh, 
uh, pea diaper type of nature so which is to be further investigated uh, thank you very much morning all myself as jayashri doing msc biotechnology in psg college of arts and science my work is synthesis and characterization of a cytosine based hydrogen from labellar rogita under the guidance of dr m satyabama introduction hydrogels hydrogels are either natural or synthetic cross linked polymers used in a variety of biomedical fields hydrogels are agents for filling vacant spaces carriers for delivery of bioactive molecules it consists of a matrix of insoluble polymers with about 96% of water content which are widely used as a deep breeding agent components of paste as wound care this considered to have huge potential when it is applied for pharmaceutical purpose but have certain important limitations like addition of antimicrobial agents uh, such antimicrobial agents are having cytotoxic effects leading to delayed wound healing also the wound dressing stick on to the surface of the wound and injure the newly formed epithelium the development of resistance among the microbial flora to the existing synthetic antimicrobial agent uh, creates a serious risk to public health for this uh, limitations uh, i have prepared by using natural polymers as chitosan from labella rogita fish scales and uh, potato peel powder and orange peel powder a uh, figure one shows that composition of hydrogel consists negative fixed ions positive mobile ions negative mobile ions cross links and polymer chains good morning all myself as jayashree doing msc biotechnology in psg college of arts and science my work is synthesis and characterization at last we got uh, chitosan powder as an extract Uh, figure 2 shows that chitin to chitosan molecular structure uh, chitin which is deacetylized and to form the chitosan structure figure 2 shows that the chitin to chitosan molecular structure then preparation of chitosan based hydrogel figure 3 shows that the uh, form molecular structure of formation of hydrogel uh, water soluble monomer as i am taken as uh, chitosan from labella rogita fish scales and the natural polymers as uh, potato peel powder and orange peel powder plus bifunctional cross linker as glutaraldehyde uh, get polymerized and form purification and swelling in water at completely to form a chitosan based hydrogel as a product preparation of chitosan based hydrogel to prepare hydrogel we want to know that um, water soluble monomer plus we want bifunctional cross linker as i am taking water soluble monomer as my chitosan polymer plus natural polymers as potato peel powder and orange peel powder plus bifunctional cross linker as a glutaraldehyde once these were mixed uh, in stirrer get polymerized purification and swelling in water at last it get into the hydrogel formation and an antibacterial study antibacterial study act, uh, antibacterial activity of hydrogel as evaluated by using agar diffusion method against the gram negative pseudomonas klebsiella e coli and the gram positive bacillus bacteria swelling study the swelling kinetics and time dependent swelling properties of chitosan hydrogel in uh, deionized water were tested equation for the swelling study is s is equal to w bases minus w base d divided by wd into 100 where wd indicates dry weight of the sample in grams uh, w bases indicates wet swollen weight of the sample at time t characterization study uh, ftir analysis ftir spectroscopy is a powerful and non destructive tool used to study conformational and structural properties of polysaccharides raw materials used for preparing the composites were analyzed to determine their chemical structure uh, the photo the spectrophotometer was used in the total attenuated reflectance mode and the spectrum was collected in the frequency range up to 500 to 4000 cm per minus 1 Some analysis, scanning electron microscopy micrographs were recorded to examine the morphology of the hydrogel. Um, high resolution images of shapes, and it is widely used to identify phases based on qualitative chemical analysis or crystalline structure. Uh, scanning yeah. electron microscopy was used for studying the combination of biopolymers in the magnification about 100 to 600 x. antibacterial study the antibacterial activity of hydrogel as elevated by using agar diffusion method against the gram negative pseudomonas klebsiella e coli and gram positive bacillus bacteria 
Swelling study. The swelling study yeah. yeah. swelling properties of hydrogen, hydrogen, ionized water. For this equation, S is equal to W base S minus W base D into 100. W base is indicates which swollen weight of the sample at time taken. At last, it is a prepared hydrogen based hydrogel picture. Figure four shows that prepared chitosan based resultant discussion. Resultant discussion. FTIR analysis. Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy is a powerful and non-destructive tool used to study conformational and structural properties of polysaccharides. Uh, raw materials used for preparing the composites were analyzed to determine their chemical structure. The spectrophotometer was used in the total alternated reflectance mode and spectrum was collected in the frequency range up to 500 to 4000 centimeter per minus 1. Uh, here the figure 5 shows that FTR images of chitosan powder uh, consists of um, uh, consists of aldehyde group, formyl group, hydroxy group and amine group. So this whole spectrum graph reveals that the following functional groups are chitosan powder. Results and discussion. FTIR analysis. The figure 5 FTIR image of chitosan powder speaks, reveals that the following functional groups are aldehyde group, formyl group, hydroxy group and amine group as chitosan powder. Next figure 6, uh, six shows that dried chitosan based hydrogel having functional groups as carboxyl, uh, formyl, alcohol and amine group. Uh, especially P cut 1049 corresponds to the CO which means territory alcohol which corresponds to the efficient cross linking of chitosan based hydrogel with glutaraldehyde that formed at the amine group of chitosan. Uh, um, next the figure 6 FTIR image of dried, dried chitosan based hydrogel peak reveals that the following functional groups are carboxyl group, formyl group, alcohol group and amine group as uh, chitosan based hydrogel. Especially at peak 1049 corresponds to the CO which means territory alcohols which correspond to the efficient cross linking of chitosan based hydrogel with glitteraldehyde that formed at the amino group of chitosan. Sem, sem analysis. Sem photograph were recorded to examine the morphology of the regenerated hydrogels. SEM is routinely used to generate high resolution images of shapes and it's um, uh, widely used to identify paces based on qualitative chemical analysis or by crystalline structure. Uh, this SEM were used for structure determination of biopolymer in a magnification about 100 to 600 X magnification. Here figure 7 and 8 shows that SEM image of chitosan powder. SEM analysis. Figure 7 and 8 shows that SEM image of chitosan powder. Both sample exhibited softness and thickness surface uh, morphology under electronic microscopic examination at 50x magnitude. And in figure 9 and 10 shows that SEM image of chitosan based hydrogel. Uh, these both samples exhibited expansion and stiffness surface morphology under electron microscopic examination at accurate 50x magnification. Here figure 9 and 10 shows that SEM image of chitosan based hydrogel. Both sample exhibited expansion and a stiffness surface morphology under electron microscopic examination at 50x magnification. Swell, swelling study. Figure 11 shows that chitosan based hydrogel before swellability. Figure 12 chitosan based hydrogel after swellability. This swellability of chitosan based hydrogel is commonly affected by three aspects. The hydrophilic nature of chitosan due to the presence of hydroxyl groups in its side chain. Presence of amino group which gets protonated in water predominantly in acidic medium. Elasticity of the chitosan polymeric matrix which allows easy diffusion of the sample. Mm. Swelling study figure 11 shows chitosan based hydrogel before swellability. Figure 12 shows chitosan based hydrogel after swellability. The swellability of chitosan based hydrogel is commonly affected by three aspects. First one is the hydrophilic nature of chitosan due to the presence of hydroxyl group in its side chain. Second, the presence of amino group which gets protonated in water predominantly in acidic medium. Third one, elasticity of the chitosan polymeric matrix which allows easy diffusion of the sample. Uh, figure 15 shows that E. coli well-diffusion plate. Figure 16 shows that Klebsiella well-diffusion plate. 
antibacterial study. The positive control was a commercial antibiotic tetramycin, which is commercially available antibiotic. The negative sample was the hydrogel, which was prepared by Kaidosan based hydrogel. The bacteria such as Bacillus subtilis, Klebsiella pneumonia, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, E. coli were examined against the hydrogel samples. Here, figure 15 shows that E. coli well deficient plate. Figure 16 was a Klebsiella well deficient plate. Figure 17 was Bacillus well deficient plate. Figure 18 was Pseudomonas well deficient plate. Um, significantly higher growth uh, inhibitory effect on the Bacillus subtilis gram positive bacteria was evident uh, con when compared to the gram negative bacteria. This is due to the fact that gram positive bacteria was more sustainable for the water detent caused by the fluid uptake than the gram active negative bacteria. Um, the interaction between the positive charge of chitosan with negatively charged microbial cell membrane was responsible for its antimicrobial property and it was well established also which results in osmotic imbalance. Uh, at the same time, potato peel powder and orange peel powder demonstrate a syngenetic effect which forms the cell membrane to direct the overall growth of the microbe. The antimicrobial activity and the exhibition of uh, significant zone of incubation by the chitosan based hydrogel may be due to the presence presence of chitosan, those antibacterial activity is attributed to its cationic nature or the uh, potato peel or orange peel content which is rich in flavonoids, phenolic compounds and the glycol alkaloids which are toxic to the cytopathogens and helps in healing wound healings uh, ultimately. So therefore the results obtained in the present study indicated that the hydrogel formation exhibited good antibacterial activity against the various gram positive and negative stains. Here figure 17 shows that Bacillus well deficient plate, figure 18 was Pseudomonas well deficient plate. China. Antibacterial study. Figure 11 shows that bar chart of antibacterial activity of four different microbial strains. Um, the positive control was a commercial antibiotic, tetramycin, which is commercially available antibiotic. The negative sample was a hydrogel, which was prepared by chitosan based hydrogel. The bacteria such as Bacillus subtilis, Klebsiella pneumonia, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and E. coli were examined against the hydrogel samples. Figure 17 was bar chart antimicrobial activity of four different microbial strains. Clear zone of incubation adjacent to hydrogel indicates antibacterial activity. A higher antibacterial activity of the hydrogel is observed against Bacillus subtilis, wherever lower activity is observed against Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Significantly higher growth incubatory effect on the Bacillus subtilis gram positive bacteria was evident when compared to the gram negative bacteria. This is due to the fact that gram positive bacteria was more sustainable to the water defect caused by the fluid uptake than the gram negative bacteria. Um, the interaction between the positive charge of chitosan with negatively charged microbial cell responsible for its antimicrobial property and it was well established also results in the osmotic balance. Uh, the antimicrobial activity and the ex exhibition of the significant zone of incubation by the chitosan based hydrogel may be due to the presence of chitosan uh, whose antibacterial activity is attributed to its cationic nature or the potato peel or orange peel content which is rich in flavonoids, phenolic compounds and the glycol alkaloids uh, which are toxic to the phytopathogens and helps in wound healing ultimately. Uh, therefore, the result obtained in the present study indicated that the hydrogel formations exhibit a good antibacterial activity against the various gram positive and negative strains. Summary and conclusion. In the summary and conclusion, I shows that FTR peak reveals that the functional groups are chitosan based hydrogel. Same photography exhibited expansion and stiffness surface morphology under electronic microscopic examination. The antibacterial activity results obtained in the present study indicated hydrogel exhibited good antibacterial activity against various positive and negative strains. Swellability property is due to the presence of hydroxyl groups in the chitosan responsible for its hydrophilic nature and the flexible property of the matrix. So finally, <coughs> The present work uh, uh, aims to incorporate the properties of chitosan based hydrogel have shown non-toxicity, biocompatibility, and antibacterial property for enable wound healing. Uh, since wound healing assay and test and patch test studies were in undergoing the process for better hydrogel with prominent wound healing properties. Based on the characterization studies, it is concluded that the synthesized hydrogel had indicated better characteristics and can be used in promising material for wound healing applications.
conclusion so finally my present work aims to incorporate the properties of chitosan based hydrogel have shown non toxicity bio compatibility antibacterial property to enable healing since wound healing acetos uh, and patch test studies were in undergoing the process for better hydrogel with prominent wound healing properties these are my references here are my references thank you thank you all good afternoon to everybody myself shukumar ayan today i am here to give the presentation of my research topic synthesis characterization and biological studies of 4 chloro 1 methyl pyrazole carboxyl aldehyde containing hydrazones this work i carried out under the guidance of dr p murli krishna assistant professor department of chemistry ramaya institution of technology bangalore and these are objectives of the presentation which includes introduction synthesis of hydrazones characterization of hydrazones by using different spectroscopic techniques called fdir nmr spectroscopy uv visual spectroscopy and lcms and we have studied applications such as dna binding and dna cleavage studies finally conclusion and let us see the introduction part of the hydrazones as we know all hydrazones are the class of organic compounds generally prepared by the condensation of aldehyde or ketone with primary amines and these hydrazones are frequently used for the preparation of metal complexes and also various kinds of organic molecules and here we have adopted the following synthetic scheme to get the respective hydrazones here we have treated benzhydrazide and hydroxy benzhydrazide with aldehyde called 4 chloromethyl pyrazole carbaldehyde in presence of ethanol and 5% glacial elastic acid to gives the respective hydrazones and after synthesis we have studied the dna interaction studies of the obtained compound by using technique called uv spectroscopic technique based on experimental observation it was found to be there will be a decrease in the absorption intensity by increasing the concentration of dna from 25 microliters to the 350 microliters and based on experimental observation the obtained binding constant kb was found to be 2.82 into 10 to the power of 4 and DNA binding interaction studies also carried up by another technique called fluorescence spectroscopic techniques and based on experimental observation here we have found that enormous decrease in the absorption intensity by successive increasing the concentration of compound from 2 microliters to the 10 microliters hence compound is potential DNA binder and the obtained binding constant was found to be 8.25 into 10 to the power of 4 and finally we have calculated various dna binding parameters like ksv is a thermolvar constant and quenching rate constant kq and regression coefficient r square and kb is a binding constant and n is the number of molecules number of binding sites and r square is a regression coefficient and percentage hypochromicity and finally we have calculated gibbs free energy and also we have carried out the dna cleavage experimental studies by using technique called gel electrophoresis techniques and here we have found that the dna cleavage activity shown by in presence of s2o2 in absence of s2o2 there is no dna cleavage activity hence the dna cleavage activity moderately enhanced in presence of s2o2 and finally come to the conclusion and we have successfully synthesized and characterized the various kinds of hydrogen by using synthetic scheme which i have shown initially and all these synthesized compounds which are successfully characterized by using various spectroscopic techniques ir nmr and lcms studies and also evaluated their dna binding interaction studies by using different techniques called absorption spectroscopic technique and as well as fluorescence spectroscopic techniques and also we have successfully carried out the dna cleavage experiment by using gel electrophoresis techniques and we have carried dna cleavage in presence and absence of s2o2 and based on all these experimental observation the compound one shown very good dna binding activity towards dna thank you hi I am Nilesh Noskod a second year BPharm student of the Neotia University Sorissa West Bengal 
टूडे माई टॉपिक इज ए फाइटोकेमिकल एंड फार्माकोलॉजिकल रिव्यू ऑन क्लियरोडेंडम इनफर्टुनेटम हुईच बिलोंग्स टू द फैमिली लैमिएसी ए प्रिसियस मेडिसिनल प्लांट बैकग्राउंड लाइफ इज इम्पसिबल उइदाउट ऑइट स्प्रेड यूज ऑफ प्लैंट्स एंड प्लान प्रोडक्ट्स मेडिसिनल प्लैंट हैव बी नोन फॉर मेलिनिया एंड आर हाईली एस्टिम्ड ऑल ओवर द वर्ल्ड एज ए रिच सोर्स ऑफ थेरापिटिक एजेंट्स फॉर द प्रिवेंशन ऑफ द डिजीजेस एंड एलिमेंट्स इन द प्रेजेंट सिचुएशन एज द होल वर्ल्ड इज सफारिंग फ्रॉम कोविड नाइन्टीन पैंडेमिक इट इज इम्पोर्टेंट टू बूस्ट अप आवर इम्यूनिटी पावर मेनी हार्बल प्लैंट इनक्लूडिंग दिस प्लैंट प्ले ए मेजर रोल टू इम्प्रूव आवर इम्यूनिटी पावर दिस प्लैंट हुईच इज बिलंगिंग टू द फैमिली लैमियसी फाउंड इन प्लेन्स ऑफ इंडिया एंड टॉपिकल रिजियंस इट इज पॉपुलर इन इंडिजिनियस सिस्टम ऑफ मेडिसिन लाइक आयुर्वेदा सिद्धा उनानी एंड होम्योपैथी This plant also contain various nutrients like sodium, potassium, calcium, zinc, iron, copper and phosphorus in different concentration. Then objective. The article aim to showcase various phytochemical and pharmacological activities of clerodendum infortunatum based on an extensive literature or survey. एग्जाम्पल गूगुल स्कलार पाबमेड एटसेट्रा मेथड एंड आप टू डेट टील आगस्ट टोटी टोटी सार्च वास डान इन गूगुल स्कलार पाबमेड सायस डायरेक्टेड डाटा बेस उइथ सेभारेल किड्स क्लियरोडेंडम इनफर्टुनेटम फार्माकोलजिकल एक्टिविटी फाइटोकेमिकल एटसेट्रा टू सिलेक्ट अल द पसिबल एंड इनफर्मेटिव एविडेंस to be reviewed in this paper search yield 49 articles after con exclusion a total 19 articles were finally selected to perform the study then result this plan contains a wide range of active phytochemical compounds including डिटारपिनएड्स टीटारपिनएड्स फ्लैबोनएड्स ग्लैकोसाइड स्टेरएड एटसेट्रा दिस प्लान शोज भेरियस फार्माकोलजिकल एक्टिविटी अकॉर्डिंग टू मोदी आशीष जे इटिओल इन टू थाउजेंड टेन इट शोज एंटी अक्सिडेंट एक्टिविटी अकॉर्डिंग टू पाल दिलीप कुमार इटिओल इन टू थाउजेंड नाइन दिस प्लान शोज एनालजेसिक एक्टिविटी अदार मेजर फार्माकोलजिकल एक्टिविटीज आर एंटी इनफ्लेमेटरि एंटी कैंसार एंटी माइकोबियल एंटी हाइपार टेंसिव एंटी ओबेसिटी हेपाटो प्रोटेक्टिव हाइपोग्लैसेमिक हाइपोलिपिडेमिक मेमोरि एनहसिंग एंड निरो प्रोटेक्टिव दें डिसन एंड कनक्लूशन Uh, in the conclusion i should tell the whole plan each uh, has its own medicinal value the various nutrients and enzyme present in the plant make it nutraceutical plant present review gives brief information about the active constituents along with the scientifically claimed medicine uh, uses for clerodendum infortunatum in ayurveda for various human ailments so we could conclude that clerodendum infortunatum may be a good natural source of pharmacologically active constituents it is believed that detail information as pre presented in the review on its phytochemical constituents and various biological properties might incentive for evolution of the uses of the plant in the medicine further research and cl clinical trial have to be carried out to uh, commercialize the potential pharmaceutical uses of this plant Uh, this plant has tremendous medicinal uses 
रूट पेस्ट इज यूज एस एंटी हेलमेंथिक एंड रूट टिकॉक्सन ड्रंग फॉर मेलेरिया एंड फीवर्स स्टीम इज यूज इन टूथेक टीम बार्क ऑफ दिस प्लान गिवेन एस स्नेक बाइट एंटी फेनम एंड सूट्स एंड लिप्स एक्स्ट्रा गिवेन इन पुरुल एंड डिस्चार्ज फ्रॉम भेजाइना लिप एंड रूट्स आर एप्लाइड फॉर ट्यूमार्स एंड स्किन डिजीजेस डिकॉक्शन गिवेन इन कॉलेरा सीस्ट आर यूज इन एपिटेक्सिस एंड डायरिया थैंक यू गिव मी अपॉर्चुनिटी टू प्रेजेंट भी आर थैंक यू वन सेकेंड Hello everyone I am Kamali from Sri Krishna Arts and Science College I am doing my masters in bioinformatics today I am going to present a topic on computational analysis on molecular discovery to treat pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma and initiation towards Before doing computational analysis we have a short introduction on cancer and its types cancer is also called malignancy is an abnormal growth of cells cancer occurs due to genetic changes with which causes cells to grow uncontrollably and this mass of cells are called tumors here comes some major types of the cancer they are carcinoma lymphoma sarcoma and melanoma carcinoma is most common type of cancer which occurs in organs and glands of the body lymphoma is a type of cancer which occurs in the blood cells is commonly called leukemia the cancer which occurs in bone muscle cartilages are called sarcomas and melanoma is a type of cancer which occurs in the pigment of the skin let's see about pancreas and cancer occurs in the pancreas pancreas is a gland organ it is a part of digestive system which provides insulin that regulates the metabolism of sugars and other important enzymes to break down the food materials when the cells of pancreas begin to multiply out of control and form a mass of cells then the pancreatic cancer arises there are two type of pancreatic cancer exocrine and endocrine the most common type of exocrine pancreatic cancer is pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma endocrine pancreatic cancer starts in endocrine cell which leads to stop the hormone production or increase the hormone production uncontrollably Pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma develops in the cell lining small tubes called ducts. These ducts carries enzyme to the duodenum. This cancer develops anywhere in the pancreas but most oftenly found in the head of the pancreas. Pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma is one of the most lethal cancer worldwide. The highest incident rate is found in North America than in other European countries with an age standard incident rate of 7.2 and 2.8 per 100,000 populations. Incident is more than man than in women with global insurance rates per hundred thousands of four point nine for men and three point six for women. This may occur due to some risk factors like cigarette smoking, family history, alcohol, increased body mass index, allergies, physical activities, etc. Diagnosing this cancer by image testing or using scope or by removing tissue for testing and blood test are needed. treatment may include surgery radiation therapy or combinations of these here comes some approved drugs for this therapy which includes capacitabine erlotinib which is a type of targeted therapy fluorouracil gemetabine leucovarin x here comes a major part of presentation biomarkers biomarkers are playing major role in diagnosing the disease and also used as measurable indicator to measure the progress of the disease biomarker can be used to determine the disease onset progression efficacy of the drug treatment which plays a critical role in improving the drug development also pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma is associated with poor diagnosis which is further complicated by the absence of validated screening and predictive biomarkers for the early diagnosis ca99 remains only approved by market for the diagnosis and re response as meant by limited by the low sensitivity and specificity 
தீசா சம்பாயம் மர்கோஸ் அசோசியேட் வித் பேன்கிரடிக் டெக்டில் அடினோ கார்சனோமா கார்போஹைட்ரட் ஆன்டிஜன் அண்ட் கார்சனோ எம்ப்ரியானிக் ஆன்டிஜன் மைக்ரோ ஆர்என்ஏ மைக்ரோஃபேஜ் இன்னிபிட்ரி சைட்டோகைன் ஒன் பேம் ஃபோர் கிளைகோபிகேன் ஆஸ்டியோபானன் எக்ஸ் Some of the protein biomarkers are particularly popular due to availability of large range of analytical instrumentation which can identify and quantify the proteins in complex biological samples. Here are some protein biomarkers and its functions. Functions include regulations of many biological functions, regulate cell motility and invention. These are some structural details of protein biomarkers. G protein coupled receptor A typical protein. HSP27. Mesothelin human cryonic. Thromoglobin TGF beta. Thank you everyone for listening my presentation patiently. myself chudhi bhumik i am bpm second year student of tanyote university west bengal i am glad to be here with you now i am going to present a slide presentation about solanum virginum and my topic is a review on phytochemical and pharmacological activity of remarkable medicinal plant solanum virginum which belong the family solanacea and it is a nature's gift to us as we already know that from the prehistoric time to the modern era in many parts of the world like plants animals and other mineral objects have a profound influence on the culture and the civilization of mankind in ancient times human being worshiped plant which are extensively essential for medicinal properties in every other way because nature is always a grand sign to show its prominent phenomena of coexistence and till today natural products from plants minerals and the basis for treating various human diseases herbal plants play a golden role not only as conventional medicine but also as state common commodities which satisfy the demand of distinct markets of the development of new drugs world health organization who mention that up to 80% of the world population are dependent on traditional medicine India possesses a well vast knowledge of traditional medicine and its practice since the ancient past. Solanum virginum is one of such medicinal plant that has mentioned in many Indian medicinal works of literature. It is crucially significant metabolites that having the pharmacological and biological properties. Solanum virginum is commonly known as wild egg plant, Indian nightshade and also yellow berried nightshade. okay now i am moving to next next slide okay in this slide i want to discuss about the botanical description of solanum virginum solanum virginum is a perennial bright green branched shrub it has ovate or long elective and hairy leaves the hairy flowers are complete regular and bisexual and 0.5 to 1 cm in length the color are purple and blue mixed The midrib and veins have two sharp prickles. Stem have prominent bodies and internodes with pinkle and hair. The berries grow in globulars bitter with many seeds. The terminating roots are cylindrical, bitter and 10 to 35 cm long. This shrub grows mostly in the wild places and dry places. Okay. Here is the geographical places where Solanum virginum grows. This shrub is native to Asia. We find it growing in wild in nepal saudi arabia afghanistan thailand yemen iraq china australia south africa japan philippines brazil malaysia and india also in india it grows as a white in dry parts of haryana madhya pradesh uttar pradesh gujarat and rajasthan okay now i am moving to next slide what is the background of this study As you all know medicinal plants have been traditionally used to treat human in various health problems since the ancient period herbal drugs are very popular due to their ease of availability and they show fewer side effects than the synthetic drugs solanum virginum is one of such important medicinal plant which are being used from ancient time and till the date for treating different health disorder it is commonly known as kontikari 
which belongs to the family Solanacea. It is mainly found in the tropical and subtropical region of the world. Okay, now I am moving to the next slide. Yes, what is the aim of this study? This article aims to review the pharmacological activity of Solanum vegetium based on the extensive literature survey. And up to date, till June 2020, search was done in Google Scholar, Scopus, Web of Science, Pingal Link, ResearchGate, Publication, PubMed, Science Direct database with several keywords to select all the possible information evidence on the reviewed in this paper. The search yields 120 articles after the exclusion, the total 57 articles were finally selected to perform the, this study. Now I am discussing about the major pharmacological activity. According to Rajendra et al, it has antimicrobial activity. Solanum vaginium leaves extract in 10%, 50%, and 25%. WIV concentration RHA 50 catch 2% ketoconazole to inhibit the growth of candida. Various extracts like alcohol, benzene, chloroform, methane, petroleum ether, cool water, and hot water from the leaf and the root of Solanum virginium were studied for in vitro antimicrobial activity against seven bacterial species and five fungal species. Excellent antimicrobial activity was found in ethanolic and chloroformic extract against the microorganism. Next, I want to discuss about anti-tumor activity. It is the major pharmacological activity. According to Onkita PJ Etiol 2014, the ethanol and chloroformic extract of Solanum virginum lip sap shown in vitro anti-tumor activity against the human hepatocellular carcinomic cell that is HEPG2 cell. Further separation and purification leads to the isolation of active component which has isolated at 2-methoxy-1,4-naphthoquinone. Okay, now I discuss about the several pharmacological activity like anti-diabetic and anti-inflammatory activity. According to Sivaji et al. 2013, an in vitro anti-diabetic and anti-inflammatory activities of ethanolic seed extract was performed by the inhibition of alpha amylase enzyme and Bolivian serum albumin that is BSA which denaturation assay respectively. The result shows that the seed of the plant have anti-diabetic and anti-inflammatory activity which supports the traditional use of the plant. Next I want to discuss about the major pharmacological activity is anti-helminthic activity. According to Priya Etiol 2010, they evaluated that the anti-helminthic activity of Solanum virginium, whole plant crude aquas, hydroethanolic and ethanolic extract of 25, 50 and 100 mg per ml concentration in distilled water, piprazine citrate 10 micrometer per ml used as reference standard. The study revealed that ethanolic plant extract at 100 micrometer per ml concentration showed the remarkable anti-helminthic property than aqueous and hydroethanolic extract. The note is similar finding on the anti-helminthic efficiency of solanium, virginium, fruit, ethanolic and aqueous extract. Now I am going to discuss about the major pharmacological activities that is anti-HIV, that is anti-AIDS activity. According to Kumar and Pandey, they researched it on 2014. They reported that the food extract of solanum virginium possesses anti-reverse transcription, that is RT activity. Non-polar extract like hexane, benzene, chloroform, ethyl acetate and acetone and aqueous extract are at dose at 0.6 to 6.0 micrometer per ml are tested to evaluate the anti reverse transcription activity. Result reveals that non-benzene and acetone extract of 0.6 micrometer per ml concentration exhibit the highest 20% of the RT inhibition, whereas extract at 6 micrometer per ml concentration. Benzene at highest 25% percentage of RT inhibition followed by hexane 20% and chloroform that is 50%. However, the food extract which is null polar of solanum virginium source lower percentage of RI inhibition with the reference and the standard duck that's N piranavid. Okay, now I, I am moving to next slide. At the result, solanum virginium is an important source of many active phytochemicals and nutrients that is alkaloid, phenol, flavonoid, glycosidic, tannin, triterpene, ligands, 
uh, it shows major pharmacological activities such as anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, analgesic activity, antipyretic activity, antibacterial, anti-tumor activity, anti-arthritic, anti-diabetic activity, acti antioxidant, anti-nephroprotective, anti-HIV, and eosinophilic activity. Okay, at the conclusion, I want to say that research in medicinal plant has grown a renewed focus recently. The main reason behind that, the system of medicine associated with the number of side effects that often cause the serious problem. Therefore, it can be concluded that Solanum virginia may be claimed as a natural source of many pharmacologically active ingredients and also a nutraceutical plant also. Okay. That's all. Here I conclude my presentation. I would like to express my gratitude to the Oxford College of Science for giving me opportunity to participate and present it here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, I am Somodhi Valdar, a second year BFAM student of the Newton University of West Bengal. My poster topic is a review on pharmacological activity of Stabilis as per Morasi, a plant having immense medicinal potentiality. Background Herbal medicine has a very significant role in treatment of many diseases and their objective roles were also recorded in ancient manuscripts, Ayurveda and Unani medicine. Even today the World Health Organization estimates that up to 80% of people still really primarily on traditional remedies such as herbs for their treatment. The medicinal plant is very popular than synthetic drugs due to their easy availability and fewer side effects. India is a versatile emporium of such medicinal plant where herbal medicine have been the basis of treatment and cure of various diseases. Strabulus asper is a very common and useful plant. Sundered gram foods contain 61.3 percent moisture, 5.59 percent carbohydrate, 12.65 percent sugar, 1.48 percent protein, 10 mg iron, 17 mg manganese, 4.2 mg copper, 3 mg calcium etc. Objective: The article aims to review the phytochemical and pharmacological activity of Strabulus as per based on an extensive literature survey. Method An up to date till August 2020 search was done in Google Scholar PubMed Science Direct database with several keywords Strabulus as per pharmacological activity, phytochemical activity etc to select all the possible and informative evidence to be reviewed in this paper. Search yields 52 articles after exclusion, a total 17 articles were finally selected to perform the study. Result Stabilized as per have a wide range of phytochemical constituents have been isolated from the plant like Vasalosite, beta cytosterol, alpha amyrin, Leufol, alpha amyrin acetate etc. The major pharmacological activities sourced by these plants are cardiotonic, antivalerial, anti-cancer, antimicrobial, antiparasitic etc. Many traditional uses of this plant as like uh, to take given in fever, eye complaints, antiseptic, antitrizant, eye complaints, diarrhea, etc. Discussion and conclusion Very common pharmacological activity as antimicrobial activity. 3 rodno T etiol. Different studies were carried out to determine the antimicrobial potential of leaves, stabilized as per ethanol extract from the sticks and leaves of stabilized as per have been shown to inhibit the growth of streptococcus mutans. Another pharmacological activity is antiparasitic. Dewey SK etiol. In vivo and triopanosomal activity of aqueous extract of leaves of Stabilis asper was studied at 550 500 
and 1000 mg ml in bars however he did not show any significant activity and was thus not taken up for in vivo studies therefore stabilizers as per may be used as a supplementary food source because it has high nutritive value and has medicinal properties to prevent various diseases it should be promoted as a cheap food source with high nutritive value and therapeutic benefits in a poor country like india to improve the nutritional and health care thank you sir greetings to all my name is pooja rani kuri i am a phd scholar from indian institute of technology guwahati the topic of my presentation is engineering of aptamers for analytical applications let's begin with the introduction what is a biosensor a biosensor is a device used for the detection of an analyte the most distinguishing feature of a biosensor is that it uses utilizes a biological component for recognition of the analyte very specifically now aptamer is one of the biorecognition element that can be used in a biosensor system aptamer is a single stranded dna or an rna sequence that has the capability of assuming a three dimensional structure by the virtue of which it can bind its target very specifically now antibody is another very uh, important and popular component of uh, a biosensor system that can be used as a bioreceptor uh, which also binds to the target very specifically however aptamers have some desirable properties over antibodies for example aptamer generation is less expensive as compared to antibody generation aptamers can be generated against uh, immunogenic as well as non immunogenic targets unlike antibodies and one of the very desirable property of aptama is that it is amenable to chemical modification or aptama engineering because of which the affinity of aptama as well as stability of aptama can be uh, increased many fold this is a schematic diagram of uh, systematic evolution of ligands by exponential enrichment uh, which is an in vitro technique to generate aptama against a selected against a, a given target Now, in general, selects uh, consist of three steps: that is, incubation or binding step, partitioning step, and amplification step. In the incubation step, uh, target molecules are exposed to, to random library to provide opportunity for oligonucleotide target binding. Now, the bound sequences are isolated from unbound ones during the partitioning step. The bound aptamers are then amplified to generate an enriched pool of target binding sequences for the next round of selection. and after several rounds of selection the enriched uh, pool is cloned and obtained clones are separately sequenced coming to modes of aptama engineering well we must understand why aptama engineering is at all required we know that protein sequences consist of 20 different amino acids while nucleic acid sequences consist of only four nucleotides therefore uh, this limited functional diversity of aptamers compared to proteins may lead to suboptimal target binding to overcome the suboptimal uh, target binding aptamer okay. modification or aptamer engineering is required now aptamer engineering uh, in uh, can be grouped into two uh, categories post selex modification which includes truncation multivalent aptamers modification with cross link uh, moieties etc pre and post selex modification uh, which are modifications which can be done uh, both uh, before as well as after selex and include phosphodiester modification nucleobase modification sugar modification etc uh well of course it is not possible to discuss uh, all uh, the kinds of modification and their subtypes so i'm going to take here only few case studies first case study being aptamer truncation Now we know that aptamers that are uh, selected by selex are usually eighty to hundred nucleotides, which are long. Uh, so we focus on aptamer truncation to reduce the size of the aptamer. Now aptamer sequences mainly consist of uh, essential nucleotides, supporting nucleotides, and non-essential nucleotides. Now supporting and essential nucleotides are crucial for target binding as they are responsible for target aptamer interaction and the formation of secondary or tertiary structures. However non essential nucleotides do not have any contribution towards these and they can be truncated or chopped off In this case study uh, I have uh, we have we can see a picture of an aptamer a schematic representation of an aptamer which was developed against VEGF165 protein which is a cancer biomarker uh, 
Uh, now, this aptomer was 56 mer, that is 56 nucleotides long. In the table, certain deletions have been shown, uh, deletions of non-essential part. Uh, now, rendering this aptomer uh, to 23 mer sequence after modification, which resulted in a 200-fold increase in binding affinity. Next case study, joining binding motifs, bivalent and multivalent uh, aptomer constructs. Now, we know the concept of avidity. When a molecule contains two identical uh, binding sites, the binding affinity is increased compared to a molecule containing only one binding site. This is because uh, a larger number of binding sites make it more likely for the target to bind to the aptomer. In this case study, an aptomer had been developed for thrombin. Uh, and using uh, thermofluorimetric analysis, this analytical system was designed. The aptomer probes consist of two thrombin binding partners, uh, which are elongated with a tail sequence. Afterwards, the two tail sequences are non-covalently conjugated via the hybridization with a paired bivalent probe, which allows sensitive detection. Coming to the final case study of this presentation, locked nucleic acid and molecular beacon. Locked nucleic acid differ from regular nucleosides as it is a uh, conformational structure is locked via a methylene bridge linking the 2 prime oxygen and the 4 prime carbon atoms of the sugar of the sugar ring, uh, thereby fixing the nucleoside in a C3 prime endoconformation. Now, this rigidity of the system enforced by this modification accounts for the high thermal stability and nucleus resistance of the locked nucleic acid modified aptomers, which increases their potential in therapeutic as well as diagnostic applications. In the schematic below, uh, we can see a uh, we can see molecular beacon created with thrombin binding aptomer. This aptomer beacon can be modified with a quencher and fluorophore at the 3' prime and 5' prime end respectively. The complementarity of the 3' prime and 5' prime end forces the aptomer in a stem loop structure. In this conformation, the fluorophore is uh, efficiently quenched. Upon binding of the thrombin, the aptomer adopts a G quadruplex structure, creating a distance between the fluorophore and quencher and results in the subsequent release of a fluoro fluorescent signal. These were few of the case studies of aptoma engineering. Uh, coming to the conclusion, aptoma serve as chemical antibodies and are potential substitutes for antibodies uh, for analytical applications. Stability and binding affinity of aptoma can be uh, increased for its target by aptoma modifications or aptoma engineering, and few of the case studies have been discussed here. These are few of the important references used, and thank you for your kind attention.
used to identify and quantify the various bioactive chemicals using the GCMS as the analytical method. And the obtained results were compared with the reference compounds of NIST library. The hypothesis of this study includes the presence of bioactive compounds in the plants and can be extracted by Soxlater method. Compounds are expected to have medicinal value to treat diseases. The objectives of this study are as follows organic solvent extract of plant materials like leaf, husk, and endosperm by Soxlate method. Organic solvents used were methanol and hexane, followed by GCMS analysis of the extract, interpretation of the result, and biological activity of the chemical. Starting the experiment, the leaves and the seeds of Moringa mellifera were procured and washed thoroughly with distilled water and dried. The dried sample is grounded and uh, that sample is used for the solvent extraction using the hexane and the methanol solvent. Soxlate extraction is as follows 10 gram of ground sample of endosperm, husk, and leaves of moringa were taken and soxlated for 6 hours by using solvents like hexane and methanol. Excess solvent is removed by distillation and extract was uh, stored at 4 degrees Celsius for the further use, and uh, the same extract was uh, given for the GCMS analysis. Results are as follows. Uh, this is the comparison is made with the uh, same sample like endosperm of various uh, solvents like methanol and the hexane. Uh, hexane was found to have more of a oleic acid, whereas the methanol extract have got the different compounds. And uh, in this slide, we see the result obtained by the husk uh, extract using methanol and uh, hexane. So here uh, many different types of compounds being extracted um, maybe due to the methanol being a polar solvent and uh, hexane being a non-polar solvent. So different types of uh, compounds being extracted uh, in the different uh, solvents. And this results uh, tell us the uh, extracts obtained from the leaves of uh, methanol and uh, hexane. So this results tell us that leaves are having the more number of uh, uh, bioactive uh, chemicals than the hexane uh, extraction of uh, leaves. Discussion uh, The traditional knowledge of medicinal plant has always guided the search for new cures and the present study of this leaf husk and uh, endosperm of the uh, Moringa oleifera plants uh, different parts uh, have uh, shown that many compounds can be extracted and uh, they have got the bioactivity uh, like uh, antimicrobial property, anti-cancerous property or some of them can act even as the irreversible inhibitor of the cytochrome P450 isozymes and they also show anti-inflammatory property, anti-androgenic property and uh, very importantly they act as sickle cell formation also and uh, they also act as antioxidants where they reduce the amount of reactive oxygen and they are the generator of antigenicity, wound healers and biomarkers for some of the uh, carbohydrates. Conclusion, so from the results obtained uh, we can conclude that uh, this Moringa oleifera contains various bioactive compounds and that can be recommended uh, as a pharmaceutical lab importance and uh, further work will, can be carried out by uh, extracting or isolating these biocomponents and uh, working on their or characterizing their molecular structure, formula and weight so that we can evaluate their safety or their toxicity for human and animal use. I'd like to acknowledge uh, my guide Dr. K. R. Siddhi uh, for his uh, support and guidance and uh, my colleagues.
Alex and Raju S and Parmesh Reddy for their support and IIT Bombay for the GCMS analysis. And I'd also like to acknowledge the Oxford College for providing the opportunity to submit or to present my Hello everyone, this is Hilaria, Assistant Professor, Department of Computer Science from New Horizon College. My paper topic is the methodological study on machine learning algorithm. Uh, so basically our uh, machine learning now it's very uh, currently it's going on like how many algorithms are there how those algorithms can be implemented on what type of an algorithm it can be implemented uh, all these questions we will be having right so how many types of algorithms also will be there so here is an answer before me moving on to the topic i'm going to take up an example paper toss so now we are going to toss the paper okay so when you're tossing a paper to a dust bin for the first atom when you toss a paper to the dust bin what happens here you may be forcefully thrown a paper so it goes very far so the, again you pick it up and again you try it up in the second atom you will come to the closest nearest to that particular dust bin and keep trying and finally a final atom what happens is you will achieve to that particular dust bin same concept here it has been implemented to a mission also so the three same uh, tossing of the paper is implemented to the mission we're going to put the program to be to learn okay so the proper definition of your machine learning is also a machine learning provides a computer with the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed okay that is uh, you keep trying a number of the times and everything is being put into a mission and that is how we are going to achieve the particular task your machine learning classification is being divided into uh, different types that is one is supervised unsupervised and reinforcement learning we'll start with the supervised learning so in supervised learning what happens is there is already a target response there is a data so means already been somebody else has been used it so target someone else target and data you are taking putting into a machine learning concept and we get a correct response correct so when you get a correct response you're going to come out with a new data so keeping the old previous data we are going to predict the new set of data is what is called as a supervised learning in supervised learning we have two types of classification one is classification problem how exactly you are going to do a classification and second one is a regression problem so what is classification problem the computer groups data together based on a deterministic characteristics so here if you see what is the characteristic when i try to group anything the stars all the stars i'm going to group them together and all the arrows i'm going to group them to an another part okay so this is what is exactly the kalska classification is doing the classification is further divided into three basic when i do a classification of an algorithm you can take any of the types of uh, algorithm can be implemented into it that is you can use a decision tree you can use a k nearest neighbor that is called as knn and super vector machine so this support vector machine can, uh, can also be used over here what is regression regression is nothing but the output so that is being continuously responding is been predicted okay that is what is regression see regression is continuously you are coming out with the same answers so that is being pre uh, predicted and then it is been given into a continuous response it is been given as this regre uh, regression is been cl classified into another two types which is called as linear regression and next one is a logistic regression so regression is been continuously responded into two types the next one is unsupervised learning now what is unsupervised learning it occurs when an algorithm learns from an example provided without any associated response there is no any associated response you take a data you take a new set of data old set also you take new set also you take come out with one process and then you are going to have a different data maybe of a same set maybe of a different set now you are going to group them and you are going to based on the different methods you are going to group them so unsupervised learning you will be having a further different types one is clustering one is associated 
deviation one is anonormal uh, detection now uh, over here you will be having an association learning what is association learning so here are it when you go to a supermarket uh, all uh, whenever we go to the supermarket you have seen the milk is kept in one place next to that there is a bread and next to the bread you will see okay there is a butter there is a cheese and there is a jam so if you see the way how they have arranged the supermarket how they have predicted is by analyzing uh, the associate learning we use the associate learning by analyzing it that is we have we know which are the item which are being frequently buy uh, by the customer so if a customer picks up the milk it's very very clearly knows okay it is a milk okay i have to buy a bread i have to buy a egg or i have to buy a butter so this is what is an associate learning that is been a branched with the unsupervised learning clustering what do you mean by clustering see ball is a ball for us like right? whether it is a basketball whether it is a uh, throw ball or whatever a ball is a ball so classify the different types of balls is what is called as a clustering see these are the inputs a machine learning algorithm i'm using is of use of clustering and i can make out the different types of balls over here so here is what do you mean by different types of classification and clustering Clus classification means s no there is stops okay clustering means grouping it into a different proper meaning is what is clustering is that is what gives you a perfect meaning over here classification stands for s or no itself types of clustering you have k means you have density you have self organization now here we have what which model or which algorithm that i have to use so a big expert also will have this question to which one you will be using it so here the problem comes you have to keep trying out and then you have to achieve whichever you use please use an accurate training time and easy method and that is what gives you a best accurate data over here and this is all about the this is a study on the impact of the covid-19 lockdown on the atmospheric no2 emissions for the study hey data is I'm collected and processed by using remote sensing in and chemistry zoology i will be talking about this air pollution studies on the impact of using covid-19 hey, remote sensing I'm data and gis and the effects of lost chemistry zoology and biotechnology i will be talking about air pollution and gis hey usage of remote air pollution and gis considered as one of the greatest threats for modern day Society and the city of I will Bengaluru is nowhere safe from it. With an estimated population of 1.23, Bengaluru is a home of pollution. As the city is in need of development, better infrastructure, and transportation data, for the purpose of this study, nitrogen dioxide is I will be talking about the physical nitrogen. Dioxide in this case, which is the data and GIS and the byproducts collected by the fossil fuel sector. I will be talking about air pollution. Yes, considered as one of the greatest threats for modern day society. And the city of Bengaluru is nowhere safe from it. With an estimated population of 1.23 crores, and Bengaluru is a home of pollution and data and data. City is in need of more development and better infrastructure. I will be talking about air pollution and for the purpose of this study, remote sensing the nitrogen dioxide is being analyzed. The data on nitrogen dioxide being analyzed is being analyzed. It is obtained by a biologist and data on nitrogen dioxide is being analyzed. Air pollution is considered. Is one of the greatest threats to the modern life and this statement was and the city of Bengaluru is no less than with an estimated population of 1.23 crores and the Bengaluru is a home of population and the city is in need of development and better infrastructure and the data on the nitrogen for the purpose of this study in the nitrogen dioxide by using the 
With an estimated population of 1.23 and it Bengaluru is the most as the city is a main highway of developing by better infrastructure and data nitrogen dioxide has been highlighted nitrogen dioxide in this case we my paper on topic application of disruptive technology for the crm through agile software development a case study this presentation includes introduction existing solution solution framework design and implementation and also conclusion introduction to give introduction to this to understand the agile software development and methodology i took pg management system as a case study because pg accommodations are generally then keeping in mind the target audience but in order to increase the effectiveness of the business our technology touch is a must so we have built this project using agile methodology this system will create a push factor for accounting and auditing system to convert into paperless form as well and also help to reduce the turnaround time increase transparency increase collaboration real time assess for the trend analysis progress tracking management etc an existing solution most of the works in this pg management is done manually and pay, and with the paper paper form which affect the work effectiveness in the in this competitive world so we have frame, a solution framework as a solution we have created our software system it has been designed to automate automate manage and look after overall processing of pages even multiple pages which helps to save money save time and also data security and to tell more about the solution framework i have lean canvas over here this will display this lean canvas will display the uh, entire entire system of uh, this software system and this will say how customer relation management will go with the technology 
so you have the problem a problem definition and also solution for that and also i have the customer who can who can buy this as a business and who, uh, who are the and what are the revenue streams on also cost structure and all etc and to, to go further i i have also uh, displayed unique value proposition this will uh, this will tell how customer and service or product will relate each other here i have customer customer side and also product or service side in customer side i have explained customer jobs or pains and also gain customer job will be collect the tenant data and know the tenant data know the financial data calculate the profit profit loss etc so uh, do, uh, while doing these jobs uh, some pains will be there or, or some disadvantages will be there or some um, issues will come that is like a uh, time constraint it may be or it, it may be more paper work they have to do and also there is a fear of data loss and difficult to send the notification to tenants um, so to this uh, pain we have the uh, in product or service side we have this system or software system uh, which will uh, look up, uh, manage all these work in one system and as a pain reliever this system will give on one time notification to everyone every tenants and then there is no paperwork at all then quick financial report they will get from this pain relievers or from this, this system uh, the customer will get the gains like they can keep the data of tenants and their payments digitally can manage multiple pages at a time and get a, a financial report in one tap so as a um, developer or as a product um, product um, head uh, he will get the gain, gains like effective so uh, gain creators are effective software and also clients feedback and reviews will be will be the game creators to him okay then to go further i have also explained design and implementation here using an agile methodology this system is implemented and uh, we also took the uh, feedback from the um, client and also we have designed this uh, um, system and i also given the screenshot of those systems here and this implementation is done by developing a system to paying guests and hostel industry with the best technology assisting them to grow their patents it is a, it is designed to automate the manage and uh, look after after the overall processing of even large hotels or pages i mean hostels or pages sorry then why this system Mm, or benefits of this system first one is a permanent tenant data store here the all data will be stored permanently uh, but till now uh, or uh, now they will use uh, if the system is not there they will use and uh, they'll store the data in either in a paperwork or it is in excel sheet so now it is digital it will store uh, so there is no fear of data data loss then automatic rent and bill calculator now uh, from this they, they can calculate how much rent rent came and how much uh, bill or how much expend expend uh, they have to expend on bills or any repairs or something like that and then multiple sms reminder if uh, the tenants didn't pay the pay the fees uh, monthly fees or yearly fees or something like that they can send the uh, notification to them saying they didn't uh, and then pay the fee so this is a reminder then check status and resolve complaints from home okay now uh, from this system uh, the system is an app in their um, mobile android mobile so they can uh, at home only they can check the status uh, status of their hostel uh, if they are uh, managing many multiple pages they can they can't go uh, everywhere at the at same same time so they can see the status of the hostel or pages and they can see the complaints and they can resolve uh, from home itself check income and expenses report in a system so Mm, this is like uh, instead of sitting and doing that ma uh, calculation manually and uh, uh, it will consume more time and also if there is a multiple pages it, it will be like even more uh, 
even even, uh, even more uh, it, it won't be like so flexible or uh, comfortable to do sit and do lots of lots of lots of uh, calculation so this is the this is the system where it will give in one tap then collect rent anytime and anywhere so since it is a digital payments um, payment is uh, payment is there in this app so this is uh, uh, they can collect rent anytime anywhere so one click account manager so um, all these in this in this system this uh, accounting and auditing will be done very easily this is the benefits of the system so to tell about the conclusion by developing a software or this system uh, with the best technology for a particular page owner the many work will be reduced to a certain extent since this kind of technology is very new to market even for the investor it will be a, it will give a big revenue and would help to gain more opportunities as this method of maintenance it uh, is not implemented till now this would help the pg owner to to grow their business and manage and look after the overall processing of uh, multiple pages uh, with less time and effort and money so overall to see this um, system or uh, this uh, page, ac page accommodation or pg manager system this will help the uh, pg owner also and also the investor also and also the customer also the customer Mm. and uh, like pg tenants and all they can do work easily they can give complaints easily uh, need not to wait for the owner to come there and they have to go uh, they have to see time that and all not there so uh, overall this is the uh, this system will help help uh, uh, this three um, three people also so um to tell about the agile methodology how this method agile methodology help in this system or uh, software development adopting an agile methodology will even help to build the application more effectively so by this case study i conclude that adopting agile methodology in the software development will give great benefits like improved product quality focuses on users focuses on business value allows for change and so that's it I thank one and all for this opportunity. Thank you. Good afternoon to all of you. I am Dr. Vishwas, working at Department of Physics, Government Science College, Bangalore. I am presenting a paper on preparation, characterization, and optical properties of CDS thin films. Uh, this is the abstract of my paper. CDS thin films were deposited on glass and silicon substrates by thermal evaporation method and uh, spray pyrolysis method. Structure and microstructure of CDS thin films are investigated by XRD, a scanning electron microscopy, and Raman spectra. Optical properties of are studied from your uh, optical transmittance spectra, the optical band gap energy is estimated uh, at different annealing temperatures by tox method refractive index of the films is estimated by the envelope method optical band gap energy is found to be 2.427 electron volt for the films deposited on glass at room temperature the optical transmittance is found to be next to preparation of cds films we have prepared this by thermal evaporation method and the spray pyrolysis method for this, uh, we used pre-cleaned glass and silicon substrates by thermal evaporation method at room temperature using CDS powder by Hindivac vacuum coating unit. And the uh, vacuum coating unit was used under base pressure of 2 into 10 to the power minus 5 tau. The distance between the evaporation source and the substrate holder was adjusted to about uh, 20 centimeter. And uh, we used spray pyrolysis method. For this, we used cadmium chloride and thiourea as the precursor materials and they are mixed at uh, 3 is to 2 ratio <clears throat> in uh, 100 ml of deionized water to obtain 0.1 molar solution. The solution is sprayed on glass substrates maintained at uh, 300 degrees centigrade. Characterization of CDS films. For this we used XRD, uh, the crystallite size by using Scherer's method. We calculated the uh, crystallite size using this relation K lambda by beta cos theta where K is the shape factor and uh, lambda is the wavelength of x-ray, beta is the full width at half maximum. 
SEM studies were used for surface morphology analysis and grain structure uh, studies and uh, Raman studies were used for crystal structure and uh, uh, using uh, phonon vibrations. And this is the envelope method to find the film thickness, refractive index and extinction coefficient of the thin films. We have to make an envelope T maxima and T minima will be enveloped like this. And corresponding to T max and T minima, we have to find out the wavelengths of these uh, spectra. And from that, we can find out the refractive index, film thickness and extinction coefficient using this relation. N is the refractive index, T is film thickness, M is an integer, lambda is the wavelength like this. And the XRD spectra of CDS thin film on silicon and glass substrates annealed at 100, and, uh, 100 degrees centigrade by thermal evaporation method is shown here. This is for silicon substrate and glass substrate deposited on silicon exhibited uh, the crystalline structure and deposited on amorphous uh, on glass exhibited amorphous structure and we found the crystallite size by Scherer's method and it is about 33.6 nanometer. This is the same image of CDS film at room temperature and annealed at 100 degrees centigrade in gear uh, deposited on glass substrate. We can see the surface morphology variation when, uh, with increase of annealing temperature. This is the Raman spectra of CDS film on silicon substrate at room temperature. We can see the fundamental and uh, weak overtones here corresponding to uh, about uh, 305 and 612 per centimeter. We have seen uh, two peaks. Uh, this is due to the uh, fundamental that means we have to consider one yellow and two yellow peaks longitudinal optical uh, vibration this is due to the phonons or uh, lattice vibrations and this is the optical transmittance spectra of cds film deposited on glass substrate annealed at uh, different temperatures uh, using thermal evaporation method we have done this and we can see that the temperature as the annealing temperature increases the transmittance decreased like this. This is due to the densification of the film and as the uh, temperature increases, the density increases and uh, uh, the film thickness decreases. This is the plot of alpha h nu whole square versus h nu of serious thin films and this is called the direct band gap energy by using uh, tox method. This is a tox plot and we have to extrapolate the straight line from this uh, uh, point to the x axis which gives the intercept that is called the optical band gap energy. It is about 2.4, 2.42 like that. And this is the optical transmittance spectra of CDS thin film on glass substrate prepared as prepared annealed at 100 degree and annealed at 200 degree centigrade. This is prepared by spray pyrolysis method and we can see that now we can compare this uh, that uh, as compared to previous case it is uh, it can be seen that the optical transmittance is lesser in uh, spray deposited film compared to thermally operated film. And this is the Raman spectra of the CDS film and uh, it is as prepared annealed at 100 and annealed at 200 degrees centigrade. We, can, we have not seen any peaks corresponding to fundamental or uh, weak overtones here. Therefore, it is showing amorphous nature here. And this is the variation of optical parameters of CDS thin film with annealing temperature the room temperature 100 and 200 degree centigrade this is the film thickness in nanometer 146 134 like that this we measured by using envelope technique and refractive index is also measured by envelope technique it is measured at 550 nanometer the refractive index increased with increase of annealing temperature and optical band gap energy decreased with increase of annealing temperature and this is the conclusion CDS thin films were deposited by thermal evaporation method and uh, spray pyrolysis method we studied XRD spectra from that we found the, the, uh, uh, the crystallite size as 33.6 nanometer same image showed the variation of surface morphology with annealing temperature from Raman spectra we found the two uh, peaks one is the fundamental another as the overtone at uh, 305 and uh, 612 per centimeter these are the longitudinal optical phonons and thermally operated film exhibited crystalline nature and uh, spray deposited film exhibited amorphous nature. Uh, this is the conclusion. Uh, thank you one and all. If you have any doubts, please ask me. Thank you. Hello everyone. I am Sikh Jodhi of Tijan College. Stay here and
to present a paper on the title of uh, Effectiveness of Emotional Intelligence in a Workplace. It goes like this. I'm just going to give the introduction. Then what are the skills required for the emotional intelligence in a workplace? And the framework of emotional intelligence, the conclusion and the reference. To start with, what is an emotion? Emotion is a natural, instinctive state of mind delivering from one circumstance. Mainly it is a mood within ourselves and the relationship with the other. There are two types of emotions, the positive emotions and the negative emotions. The positive emotions are the love, appreciation, happiness, hope, enthusiasm, confidence, the gratitude. And some of the negative emotions are the fear, the anxiety, stress, jealousy, depression, the envy, sadness, worry, sickness, all this. So these two emotional intelligence, emotions which we have within ourselves, it gets affected not only us and the people who are around us. Today as topic, when we go to talk about the emotional intelligence, here the definition states that it is the capacity of recognizing our own feelings and those of the other for motivating ourselves, managing our own emotions as well as the relationship. So this emotional intelligence is also calculated as the emotional quotient. It is managing of our own behavior, moving and with that moving smoothly with the social situations, making critical choice in our life with the other. To talk with it today in this world, till now we were talking, IQ is very important, intelligent quotient, but it says that it is only 20%. This picture represents the 80% if a person is very dependent in the emotional intelligence. It makes them to work higher with the 20% of the intelligent quotient. When a person is able to solve the issues of himself and with the others, the intelligence which he has also helps him in hand in hand to solve the other problems. To start with, this is the main framework or the main area how our emotional intelligence works. These are the four areas, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness and the relationship of the management. So this makes us to find out how we are, what I see within myself, what I see the people around me. So the personal competency and the social competency. With that, when I'm going to others to be managed, what I can do, how I can do, and the relationship, what I can do for the other, that will be taken as the relationship management the area which we have. So this is the main area, four main competencies which a person may have for the emotional intelligence. Self-awareness, self-management, social awareness and the relationship management. So this is the framework which we have. The framework which I talk about to introspect within myself, that is the intrapersonal relationship, that is the one realm which I got it in. The next one we talk about the interpersonal relationship and what is the adaptability I'm going to use with the other people and with it myself. To all work well, we got the stress management skills and the stress management skills which I'm going to use upon. Next, what are the skills required? The ability to quickly reduce the stress within me and with others. The ability to recognize and manage the emotions within me and with the other. Next one, the ability to connect with others using a non-verbal communication. Then the ability to use the humor of play and the challenges. And finally, the skills which is required to have a positive sense to resolve the problem which we are going through. 
with this I have a chart prepared for four, six families of emotion chart. The first one is the positive of happiness, cheerfulness, delighted and joyfulness. Next is sadness, the depressed. The chart the next one will be the chart of questionnaires which is prepared of the surprised level, the shocking level. And the fourth one is the anxiety. The fifth one is the sudden anger, the annoyed and irritated level. And the last one, what are the creative measures, innovations which I'm preparing. With this sixth chart of questionnaire, which I prepared for the 50 people in my workplace, I see to a conclusion of different years. Self-awareness and self-management. Next and the social awareness and the relationship. So, in the first two years, we are not introspecting among ourselves. What I require, how I am, there is no way of checking. I think about only the workplace and I'm doing. The third and fourth, fifth year, it talks about, I'm started thinking about myself and I'm not thinking about my the workplace. But in the fifth to seven years, it has been found that the people who think about ourselves as well as they think about the social awareness and it starts growing and on. So this graph shows us that slowly there is a drastic change of the awareness about the society as well as the personal awareness which is going to be brought together. The final conclusion which I want to give here is there is no doubt of evidence that the emotional intelligence in predicting the so personal as well as the social success. It gives, it gives for me the relationship between myself and the society which makes them to feel about others and think about others and work with my capability and the capability of others to grow in my, in my workplace successfully. And these are the references which I have made Thank you for giving me this opportunity for making me to do this program. Good day, everybody. This is Jay Prabha from T. John College, and my co author is Mr. Yashwant Balan, also from T. John College. And our topic for this conference would be how machine learning is being used to bring about quality education in real world or in educational. Um, uh, the, first of all, what is machine learning? Machine learning is how the user makes the machine understand what he thinks. This can be achieved or developed using computer programs. Some of the applications that we, uh, where machine learning is used in real world would be image processing, video gaming, robotics, self-driving cars and so on. But however, it plays a vital role in educational sector. There are many ways in which quality can be brought about in education, but the latest and the smartest would be through machine learning technology. Machine learning is a part or it is a subset of artificial intelligence which can bring about a customized or a standardized form in educational field. There are many ways or methods to bring about uh, this machine learning or rather the machine learning has many methods to bring about uh, quality and uh, quality among the uh, students or faculties or in their curriculum. Some of them are adaptive learning. Adaptive learning uh, is a method that is used to that uh, that uses computer algorithms to deliver lecture or resources to every learner uh, in a standardized form so that the same data is being reached to multiple students or multiple learners in the same way. The next one is predictive analytics. Predictive analytics is a statistical technique to pr predict the future using historical data. The uh, per personalized learning is an environment where every student is given a complete attention and understand through some understanding through some customized learning resource. This personalized learning. 
um, so actually what is this historical data is for example if we have a standard 10 set of students uh, 10, 10 set of students we can collect the complete academic data as well as your personal data and train that unprocessed data using some algorithms these algorithms would be linear regression logistic regression um, decision trees k means algorithm knn uh, uh, algorithm random forest and so on using these algorithms this set of data that is being collected from standard 10 class can be trained and we can predict or the user can predict a model out of it what kind of prediction can be done what kind of job a, stu a student is going to select in his future or what kind of higher studies he is going to select in his future after his standard 10. Maybe he is going into this MBBS field or IT field or engineering field or taking up some government examinations. So this can be predicted from already existing trained data. The data need, need not be trained only using algorithms of the tools like NetX, Presentation Translator, Clofus, Fixter, Math, Brainly, and so on. In future, if some unprocessed data can be given to this trained data, the unprocessed data can also be trained and decisions can be made accordingly. These decisions are used and analysis is made out of how many students are going to take up the common job, how many students are going to take up the private job. This helps the student to analyze and understand his future and select what kind of course he is going to select after his standard 10. Actually, this kind of designing helps the management or to bring about a standard in a standard in designing a curriculum or bring about a quality in designing a curriculum. This is also used in help predicting the future of the student or help him decide his future, making analysis with the historical data as to which field he has to take in his future. So this brings a standard in curriculum and also see and also uh, sees that every data is reaching every student in a customized form so that every st student achieves what he wants in future. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Vinita Tapaska presenting the paper uh, titled Spam Filtering and Role of Software Agents. Uh, the spams is uh, the e unwanted emails which we receive in a spam folder which we actually uh, do not intend or we have never requested for such emails or uh, even while we are searching the web pages we receive some unwanted web pages which we actually didn't intend to search for right so those are what we call it as spam so we are talking about uh, the technologies or uh, techniques which are used for filtering such spams and uh, these uh, techniques uh, are not uh, dynamic they are pretty static techniques which has to be upgraded frequently so uh, rather than that we are uh, proposing a usage of uh, uh, software agents which do have intelligence and uh, the environment in which they work they adopt to that environment understand that environment and automatically uh, react based on the environment uh, situations right so using those software agents if we can dynamically update the spam filtering techniques uh, that will enable to filter the spams uh, really accurately and um, uh, make sure that we do not receive uh, such spam uh, messages or spam web pages when we are uh, searching or when we are uh, categorizing our emails so let's start with uh, f with the introduction what i wanted to uh, tell is uh, spams is something which we uh, which gets done written in large volume which we see in society we see in our emails also many spams getting uh, coming day on daily basis even when we search on the web pages we feel that there are many web pages which are getting listed which are actually not uh, uh, the content which we are looking for right so uh, as the spams are increasing in large number even the techniques to filter the spams are increasing in large volume right so there are many uh, spam messages which are uh, uh, which are coming on day to day basis and there are filtering techniques also uh, getting improved on day to day basis to filter the spam messages based on the content of that message 
now to improve an anti spam uh, technology right uh, which i told most of the anti anti spam technologies are static right so this paper is proposing uh, alteration in bayesian filtering technique uh, where we are trying to incorporate the intelligent so uh, software agents uh, which will uh, do dynamic uh, changes uh, to an uh, to an filtering technique and to a database uh, so that spams uh, can be identified the latest uh, spams which are the spammers have uh, found out the latest spams the latest uh, um, spam identifying techniques can be easily incorporated with the experience and with the knowledge of agents dynamically now the intelligent software uh, agents will observe uh, the environment which in which they are working and they will uh, alter the filtering algorithms or the databases which are maintaining the spam uh, keywords or uh, the spam words right so they will keep on altering those databases or keep on altering the filtering algorithm so that uh, they are up to date and they are able to identify the latest types of spams also right now what is a spam to be defined as it's something which we uh, never expected we never uh, asked for some unwanted digital communication which we never asked for right so such uh, uh, messages digital communications which we receive often in the form of email or in the form of a web page which is unwanted web page when we are searching certain query is what we call it as a spam now spams are usually in bulk right they are sent in bulk uh, basically spams are used for sending a mail because it's one of the cheapest way to communicate with the thousands and lakhs of people together right that's the reason the spam is also used for advertising for the products and services if you want to advertise then spam is the easier way to adopt for because it can be sent in bulk to lakhs of users together uh, nowadays the spam is also used for communication in criminal activities right so stock market frauds right so goods and services uh, trafficking illegal goods and services trafficking communication related to that for those also spams are used so those activities also come under the wider umbrella of the spam now there are two categories of spam one is boosting spam technique right which basically increases the relevance of the page or increases the relevance of the email which you are receiving and make it like a valid email right so what it basically does it is repeats a certain keywords uh, it basically repeats certain keywords which make that mail or which make that web page more relevant and more uh, proper right so it just repeats those words in that uh, that um, content so that uh, that web page is selected as a relevant page or that email is selected as a relevant email right so second technique is a hiding technique which basically hides the boosting effect right so it hides certain keyword which which will help us to identify that it is a it is a spam which will help us to identify that it is a scam it hides certain uh, keywords like that so that we are not able to identify that that web page or that email is a spam right so basically maybe uh, makes it a, make that keyword as a transparent color or make that keyword as white so we cannot see it or it hides a visible property set it to false for html tag and make that word to be hidden so that we cannot identify that document is a spam right so these are the two techniques uh, two ways in which they create the uh, spams right now uh, content and link spam technique is basically a boosting technique where we increase the relevance of the page or relevance of the email by uh, uh, repeating the keywords right so multiple times we repeat the same keyword uh, uh, then that page may that page becomes more relevant or that email becomes more valid email and uh, it will be uh, not uh, considered as a spam right uh, the second uh, example is combat spam combat spam is basically a spam which is used in um, as a hiding technique where we are going to hide a certain technical uh, certain keywords which make uh, make me understand that it is a spam or it is uh, not a valid uh, web page or it's not a pay web page which is which is has a, having a highest relevance right so to identify that i may have certain keywords stored in my database so this combat spam just hides those uh, content from the web page so that i will not be able to identify that it is a uh spam so as we have understood now what the spam is and what are the different categories uh, in which the spams gets created 
right and the examples of uh, certain spam like combat spam and uh, link spam uh, let's go and understand agent te technology which we are proposing here right so just first let me define what is software agent right it's an entity which acts on behalf of other and perform its action in some level of proactivity and reactivity right so it's basically uh, some software code which acts on behalf of me right or which takes action on behalf of me or which takes decisions on behalf of me proactively right and it do have certain uh, uh, certain features like learning features right so software agents can learn based on the environment where they are working into or can learn from the environment where they are working into and they can cooperate with other objects or other components of the system and they do have a mobility where they can move in a network from one place to another place so that is what is a software agent so in, in simple terms if i have to say a software agent is a is a, a code which can move around a network right and it has a ability to act on my behalf or to take decision on my behalf proactively based on understanding of the environment which it has or based on the learning which it has done before right so that's what a software agent is now software agent has the following four basic characteristics one is autonomy right reactivity proactiveness and social ability now autonomy is a feature where the software agent is able to take decision on behalf of you right it's a it's a feature where a agent can take decision uh, on its own based on the experience and the learning which it has reactivity is be in the environment if there are certain situations or there are certain uh, situations which are occurring the software agent has a ability to react to such, such situation and uh, proactively take certain actions right it need not wait for the user input or user instruction proactiveness is another important characteristics of a software agent where it proactively takes a decision on behalf of a user and software agents do not work alone they they do have a social ability they do communicate with other components of the software they do uh, communicate with others uh, so other agents which are working in a system and collaboratively they can work right so that is what are the characteristics of a software agent there are different techniques of spam detections right which are presently uh, being used of course these are not the only few there are many other techniques but few which are popular have been listed here the first one is signature matching right now in this technique uh, the vendors of the uh, of this uh, spam filtering uh, software the people who develop the spam fil filtering software or anti spam software they maintain the large number of um, test accounts okay and they'll keep on monitoring the uh, the servers or the uh, network nodes from which the spams normally arrive and uh, they will wait for those spams to arrive once those spams arrive they will generate a 132 uh, bit or 128 digit uh, based one signature right now this signature will be added into their database and that database will be circulated to all or uh, will be used by all their anti spam softwares and if any message comes with that same uh, 128 uh, digit or 32 digit based signature then that will be considered as a spam right so here once the spam message comes uh, there will be a digital signature a signature calculated based on the content of the spam and that signature uh, will be stored into a uh, uh, database anti spam software database it will be updated into anti spam uh, anti spam software database and whenever we receive a mail the anti uh, uh, we receive a mail the, the mail will be checked by an anti spam software and the uh, anti spam spam software will calculate the a signature for each and every mail now for any particular mail the signature uh, the signature comes to be uh, comes to be equal to what is stored in the anti spam software database then that is considered to be a spam and it is blocked right so that is signature matching 
Next approach is heuristics approach, right? And now in this approach, there are a fixed set of rules which are identified to ident uh, to, uh, which are listed to identify that the uh, incoming message is a spam or not. So there are fixed set of rules which are identified by the vendor or by the anti-spam software creator, and those rules are incorporated into a software. And if any message or any incoming mail matches matches to that rule, then it is considered to be as a spam. The third approach is Bayesian filtering. In Bayesian filtering, there are two sets of databases maintained of keywords, right, uh, of words. One we call it as a spam words database and another one is a non-spam word database. Now any message comes to the email server or any email which comes to the email server, each word of that email server is picked up and we find out whether that word belongs to spam or non-spam. Now for every word this is done and finally the Bayesian algorithm calculates the probability of this email being a spam or not spam based on number of words matching to the spam and non-spam category. The next approach is DNS blacklisting. Right? In this method, it's one of the oldest method, in this uh, the servers right which are basically sending a spam emails and spam messages or small web spam web uh, pages web pages right they are uh, listed into a blacklisted host category and uh, any messages coming from those hosts right those servers from those ip addresses will be blocked by uh, blocked uh, considering it to be as a spam that's the easiest method like you know that these are the in a network uh, these are the nodes or dnss which are sending you the spam messages then any message coming from there you are blocking right but it's one of the older technique because if that server is sending a genuine some email then that will also be blocked right the next one is a challenge response system where uh, once the mail is received by the uh, server, uh, by the server, received by the server, we send a challenge question to a sender, right? Now the sender has to respond to that challenge question, then only that message is considered to be as genuine and valid and not a spam, else that is considered to be a spam. So these are the various techniques for dete detection of spam. Now in each of these techniques, you they, they do have a drawback, like in signature matching, you need to generate based on the content, the digital signature, and it has to be incorporated into a database. In heuristic, there are fixed set of rules which are already predefined. So if a spammer really wants, he can bit around, uh, hit around the bush and find out some different ways of uh, 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 right uh, overriding those uh, rules. Right? In Bayesian filtering, also there is a database of spam words and non-spam words created. Right? They have to be updated, and based on the spammers' um, uh, new new approaches of creating the spam. Uh, uh, the algorithm has to be updated to identify whether the message which is received is really a spam or not. DNS blacklisting, as I already told, there is a blacklisted uh, host list, right? Even if there is a genuine message coming from there, we are blocking it, which is not practicable, right? Challenge and response system is again we are waiting for the response for, from the server side and if the, uh, uh, the the sender is busy and do not uh, respond immediately or there is a blockage in the server then we will not receive the reply from the uh, from the server from the sender and then we'll consider that message as a spam and that may be an important email or a message right so with all these uh, drawbacks right where uh, the filtering uh, techniques are not getting dynamically updated or the databases which are maintained for filtering uh, filtering the spams they are not getting dynamically updated what we are proposing is using an agent in this Bayesian filtering where the non spam uh, spam and non spam databases are up updated frequently right based on the environment where uh, the uh, the software is working the anti spam software is working and uh, so that we have uh, spam and non spam database updated and even the uh, uh, algorithms used for identifications are updated based on the uh, new new spams which are being getting generated on day-to-day -day basis.
right so uh, that's what we are proposing here basium spam filtering only but by using a software agent so in basium spam filtering we basically identify the keywords as i told you spam and non spam keywords and we maintain two databases of each keywords right once the server receives the incoming message or a mail we classify them as a ham or a spam ham is a valid uh, message spam is a invalid message ham is valid and spam is invalid now of course we identify this by using a database which are maintained of a keyword now the spam messages are stored in a separate file uh, where the user will not uh, read it regularly that's what normally happens with email also and whereas ham messages are sent to the user right uh, uh, maybe he will see it immediately now if the user finds the ham message uh, in spam file right so he goes to a spam and he finds that there is certain mail which he would have received it's a proper mail then based on the user input right the algorithm will be updated the database will be updated with the proper keywords right so that next time onwards with the next iteration onwards automatically we improve upon our filtering at the next level so that we get the proper ham messages and they do not go into the spam files right so we are planning to propose a agent which keep on monitoring the uh, the user and identifies whether the user is getting any ham message in a spam file if he is getting that message then we are requesting the user to prompt it to us and our database and algorithms will be updated based on that so that uh, uh, so that our algorithm becomes more better in identifying the spam now uh, we want an agent to work here right so agent based on the user accessing the file from the spam area right the agent will identify and agent will add those keywords into the uh, non spam databases and make the database as up to date so that filtering algorithm also uh, improves further in the next iteration now uh, to conclude the paper uh, it basically talks about uh, a method where a software agent is used uh, for uh, filtering for filtering of a spam and uh, changes the algorithm and the database dynamically understanding the environment where the agent is working thank you hello everyone I am Ashwini Acharya, assistant professor, Department of Computer Science, the Oxford College of Science. So let's look at the innovations in nanotechnology in combination with artificial intelligence. So introduction. So what is nanoscience and nanotechnology? They are the study and application of extremely small things, and they can be used across the other section, other science fields, there, such as chemistry, biology, physics, material science, and the engineering. So, what is this nanotechnology? They may be able to create many new new materials and devices with a vast range of applications, such as medicine, electronics, biomaterials, and energy production. Let's nanotechnology what's a nano it's a nanometer is a unit of length that is equal to 1 billion of a meter that is 10 power minus 9 so what is the technology it's making use of usage and knowledge of tools and machines and techniques so in order to solve a problem like for the specific function let's see the history of the nanotechnology so the ideas and concepts behind nanoscience and nanotechnology it was first started by the physicist richard feynman so he described the process to manipulate and control individual atoms and nuclei and molecules let's look at the applications of nanotechnologies for flexible electronics so their nanomaterials are playing vital role so for designing of electric and electronic chips processors and etc we can create a components with the necessary electronic properties and we can make the technology as much as flexible as possible let's look at the nanotechnology in memory and the storage so it's a here the diagram illustrates a 2 gigabyte hard drive it weighs about 70 pounds This was first used in 1980s, and the cost is ranged from dollar eighty thousand to one lakh forty thousand. Let's look at one of the applications of uh, nanotechnology in nanomedicine. What is nanomedicine? 
Nano medicine is an interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary field of science. Even project needs contributions such as physicists, engineers, material chemists, biologists, and end user such as an orthopedic surgeon. Then molecular na nanotechnology. They are enabling technologies. They are the important technologies or enhancing technologies used for analyzing and repairing the human body. Then how we do, re do repair in the machine applications. So example includes miniature surgery. Then you have tissue reconstruction. Then eliminating of all common diseases, including all the what all the medical pains related to a human being and sufferings. What is artificial intelligence? What is an AI? It's a combination of machine learning and deep learning. So, what are the in things inside AI? The computer vision, and we have natural language processing for processing of <coughs> natural language specifications. Then let's look at production of AI. So, what is intelligence? The capacity to learn and solve problems. So, what is artificial intelligence? It's a simulation of human intelligence by machines. We are making use of, we are utilizing artificial intelligence to solve many problems. Then you should act rationally, you should act like human beings. So, what are the principles of AI? It includes reasoning, knowledge, planning, learning, and it should be able to have communication tasks. Then we have perception and the ability to move what to move and manipulate the objects. Then art AI can be defined as a science and engineering that makes up intelligent machines created by humans, especially we are dealing with the computer programs designed by humans. So now what are the applications? Let's look at the few applications of artificial intelligence. Applications are natural language processing. So, what and all were natural language, it will be local language will be processed into machine language. Then you have virtual personal assistant, then visualization, then audio analytics, graph analytics for uh, predicting the share market, then image analytics, then inter IoT as the latest technology, you have robotics and software robotics, then machine learning, social network, and etc. So, one of the applications of AI is the communication. So, how the it is helping the retailers to improve the customer experience, just like in the flip card. I say you have chat box, they are able to understand and respond to the customer requests. Then all voice recognition help retailers to surface relevant content to each consumers. So, how the data is analyzed to create customer profile, and it can be compared to similar customers to predict the preferences and some etc. So how the artificial intelligence work with the nanotechnology? So we have human intelligence. There are processed by machines, especially the computer systems. So this procedure includes learning, problem solving, planning, reasoning, and self-correction. So what is this? We have the term called digitization or the digital transformation of the society and therefore increase the economy of the nation. So here analog in conversion of analog transformation that is analog signals or analog information we are converting to text, photographs and voice among people through digitization. The transformation is carried out by the electronic devices like scanners and specialized computer chips and the knowledge is organized into bits format that is binary that computers can process since computer know only the binary language. Some of the nanotechnology along with that AI is the artificial neural network, fuzzy logic systems, deep learning, analog to digital conversion and it will be helpful for GSM communication. So AI in nanotechnology, one of the application is called the respirocrite. So a proposed nano robot artificial red blood cell is of one micron. So we have spherical nano robot. It's made of 18 billion atoms. Then a pressure tank can be pumped to 9 billion oxygen that O2 and CO2 molecules. Then you have pressure sensors releases the oxygen or carbon dioxide in that respirocrite. Then it bottom line that mimics the action of hemoglobin 
that is filled with the red blood cells hemoglobin usually present in the human blood so and it can deliver 236 times more oxygen per unit than the red blood cell so what are the applications of this respirocry so it it will be used in treatment of anemia transfusions and perfusions then fetal and child related disorders then one of the applications of nanotechnology is the medical nano robots includes molecular technology along with the artificial intelligence so they will change the medicine its into its foundations this includes nano computers molecular scale sensors tools and program to repair damage to cell site tissues then you have selective destruction example for example you have to destroy the cancer cells you have to recognize and destroy what kind of cancer cell cells to be destroyed so again how the artificial intelligence work with the nanotechnology ai for nano scale design so what are the things required for here software to design molecules then molecules that can be designed then applications of this is creating new medicines catalyst then automatically precise the field so conclusion so everything we have uh, combined with artificial intelligence with the nanotechnology we have so called bio inspired dna computing the advanced computing so advanced technologies and we can reconfigurable architecture memory and we have computational principles these will be used to enable novel data representations to implement machine learning paradigms and to solve the complex problems in the wide variety of applications in and it, it thereby it is solving the latest technological problem etc thank you I am Satya, working as assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science and Applications. Uh, along with me, Kalaisen V K, uh, who um, both are going to present uh, the paper on enhanced quality checking of clot design pattern using artificial neural network and edge-based imaging methods. in this uh, uh, presentation so we are going to uh, discuss about uh, the abstract uh, introduction to artificial neural network uh, edge based in painting method methodology discussion and conclusion uh, topics are there okay, in this slide we are going to present uh, the abstract of the paper okay quality inspection is important in the textile industry uh, the uh, quality inspection is usually carried out by the uh, by, uh, by human being that is uh, the uh, inspectors will be uh, inspectors will be doing that uh, but uh, it leads to error uh, and uh, it is a repetitive task so in order to reduce the time as well as in order to reduce the error uh, so we are applying the uh, artificial neural network method uh, to identify the design effects in the textile industry okay we are identifying the design uh, defects which we have on the uh, cloth Okay. the design defect is identified based on few parameters uh, those are uh, the standard fibers uh, yarns uh, then fabric construction color fastness uh, surface design and uh, fi uh, finally finished garment products so uh, this paper it focused on uh, the focused on enhancing the quality of a cloth design pattern uh, we have applied artificial neural network technique uh, for identifying the design defects uh, and uh, we uh, actually we are taking the image of uh, those uh, uh, cloth uh, and the with the images we are identifying the defects on uh, defects on the cloth uh. Uh, for this we have taken 50 design patterns uh, so 25 will be used for training and another 25 is used for uh, testing so we have to um, Uh, we uh, like statistical values uh, 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 is been applied uh, uh, like uh, density smoothness uh, kurtosis uh, are calculated from the segmented images uh. okay artificial neural network uh, is a computing system which helps us to simulate the human brain and it processes the information okay so it is a foundation of artificial intelligence uh, um, which helps us uh, to handle large amount of data Okay. 
neural networks uh, it takes uh, input data in the form of pixel it applies the computations uh, and it generates the result uh. okay so we are applying the in painting method uh, for uh, identifying the uh, defective images so in the defective images if any missing parts are there so those missing parts uh, will uh, those missing parts will be avoided uh, and the images will be uh, traced out uh, by the um, nearby pixels so in painting method help us uh, to trace out the image uh, which is uh, defective by applying the pixels uh, which are nearby so in this method has been applied uh, in uh, paint oil paintings uh, photographic prints uh, in uh, three dimensional sculptures uh, or digital images and video okay, the steps involved uh, in checking the cloth design pattern are so we are taking the image of uh, the design pattern then if the, if there are any defects uh, in the image pattern means uh, then it has to be identified uh, and cleared uh, by applying the in painting method okay, if we are applying the in painting method uh, we will get the clear image so with that clear image uh, we are giving uh, uh, we are uh, giving in, uh, this image as input to the artificial neural network if we are giving this image as the input to the artificial neural network so it identifies a defective design pattern so if once of the defective two design patterns are identified uh, then uh, we uh, then uh, so those defective design pattern clots will be avoided uh. so the, in this uh, uh, by following this uh, uh, set of steps uh, we can automate the fabric design classification slide the effect of path attenuation on channel performances in mobile communication slide introduction the path attenuation in cellular wireless system is the reduction of the signal strength and power density of the electron magnetic wave propagated through the space the path loss depend upon the following factor number 1 gain of the antenna used at the transmitter and the receiver when the distance between the transmitter and the receiver is more there may be chances path loss will be more next is your any loss associated with the hardware imperfection so in the sense i if any hardware component will be damaged or hardware component will be as a so loose connection or your world hardware component there may be chances of getting of the path losses in more so next the your propagation of the path less increasing not only in the frequency but or but also the distance between the transmitter and the receiver next the slide the cause of the path loss number 1 multi path next is bad line site next is weather condition so in case of the multi path basically whenever transmitting the data from the sender to receiver in case of the multi path it will the signal will go in the different way that is called the path so so when signal will transmitted in the cr transmitted it will be arise to the receiver from different direction it will be in the different path length attenuation and the delay resultant signal will be received in the different different the different receiver a result of which with result of which there will be more chance of the collision and path will break continuously so in case of the mesh base so each node of the mesh base or it may be in the tree base is no mesh base since each node will be connected to each other a result of which there may be chances of getting of the path will be or loss will be more so in case something also in case of this tree base also in the more 
next is your bed line side if the imaginary line side will be drawn between transmitting and the receiving antenna the optical side will exist when there is no obstacle in the certain area around the optical and that is called occasional zone and the radio frequency will be clear inside here next is your weather condition so weather condition the wind cause the fading of antenna due to the moment the fade of the uh, ripple factor signal 2.4 gigahertz to maximum reach to the 2.2 uh, db kilometer when there will be heavy rain density around 150 mm per hour in particular place there will be chances of getting the signal or the path loss will be more in case of the rainy season next is the antenna antenna when the antenna direction will be changed there will be chances of the path loss will be more in case of the direction antenna next is the predictation so there will be the two way to predict the path loss in case of the uh, year in the wireless communication number 1 is called is your predictable or empirical method the predictive uh, statistical or the empirical method you can be calculated by the uh, kukumura hota and next the post hota mole next is your wc wiley etc model so in this case whenever you are entering the number of input the input device after processing according to formula according to the model and it will be going to be given the output at the result of which the path loss will be more next is the physical law propagation or in case of the deterministic method so in the deterministic method physical law propagation one of the ray tracing is the one of the method in case in which we will describe the propagation phase in such a the building roof wind and the roof and the wall so when building site roof site window site is closed and door is closed window is closed and wall is closed then there will be less of getting the signal at the as the result of the path of path losses chances will be more in case of the next is called the path loss other frequency medium wave frequency small wave frequency next is your microwave frequency are predictable similar method in case of the very high frequency ultra high frequency very high frequency range is 330 to 300 megahertz and next is your ultra high range frequency is 300 to uh, 30 gigahertz basically used in case of the walkie talkie in case of the police army navy air force they do are vip person they will use this police next to taxi person also ola uber next to cellular phone also you this the technique so next to uh, your free path loss formula the free path loss so formula dip, depends upon the proportional to the square of the distance between the transmitter antenna and the receiving antenna so when the distance will be more at the result of the signal strength will gradually decrease and the path loss will be more so next the proportional to square of the frequency of the radio signal so when the signal strength will be multiplied then it will be path loss will be more so generally calculated to the equation equation will be 4 pi d by lambda whole square keep in mind 4 pi d by lambda whole square again lambda is equal to f by c again you can give in the 4 pi d f by lambda whole square so lambda is the signal wavelength calculated in meter next the frequency range is calculated in the hertz d the distance between the transmitting antenna next is the receiving antenna basically calculated in the meter next is the speed the speed the speed the speed of the light in the vacuum so 3 into 3 into 2 2.2.99 79 2458 10 to power 8 meter per second or 3 into 10 to power 8 meter per second so next the channel performances channel performances in wireless communication there is to the allocation keeping with the things of mind of the allocation with the efficient and the efficient manner 
so there should not be any uh, types of the disturbance in the communication like cost truck signal fading lack of channel availability no reduction in strength the cross ranking in the sense whenever you are calling somebody is calling in that channel somebody is sharing the resource in that channel that time you will be finding the channel performances is and failure of chances will be more the signal fading so when signal will be not in out of range so you will may be very large very less chances of getting the signal that is called signal fading lack of the channel availability check out lack of the channel availability in the sense so whenever you are sharing the channel in the 10 o'clock or that year or in the morning time or in the office time so there may be chances of the lack of channel availability so you have to share the proper channel properly so that you will get the signal so if you can channel lack of the channel availability the path loss will be more most of the prediction the signal strength also be here less so you can now reduce the signal strength next is your conclusion so accuracy path loss so uh, prediction field measurement will perform due to the radio link path loss between the transmitter receiver the field strength uh, decreases with increasing the system performances next is your so when the, the distance between the transmitter station and the receiving station will more gradually it will be signal strength will reduce and chances of will be will be path loss will be more next is your power power the power station the power station between the transmitting and the receiving station should be maintain the minimum voltage so that whatever the sender is sending and the receiver is getting to the exact data a result of that only we should not find any types of the path break in case of the wireless communication path may be power may be ac or the dc ac stand for the alternative current or dc stand for the direct current so that it can be maintained minimum voltage like the path break in the radio frequency that will be affect the performances of the uh, radio signal so when signal will not maintaining the cell minimum power and not maintaining the distance between the transmitting and the receiving station a result of fluid always it will make the path break and it will affect the performances of the signal so that to avoid such a problem all this company are maintaining to to keep the channel to channel always connectivity and they will be take care all these things in the different company like bns bsnl company reliance company or telecom company company they will make this station tower station minimum within 10 km or they will maintain the minimum voltage so that data can packet can be delivered from the sender to receiver in very easily this is all about this my topic and when the performance will be when channel will be path will break it will obviously affect the performances of the given channel keep in mind so, so this is all about my topic and thank you thank you all so next section i am going to discuss about other topics Hello. So the title of our paper is "Application of Mail Processing for Assessment of Banana Fruit Maturity," which is presented by Nadu Fernandi and Brendan Narmada. So in the abstract, we see, we see that the quality of the fresh banana fruit is a main concern for consumers and the food industrial trade. So the ability to identify maturity of fresh banana fruit will be great support for farmers to optimize harvest phase, which will have to avoid them under mature maturity and over maturity banana. In this study, we attempt to use image processing technique to detect the maturity stage of fresh banana fruit by its color and size value from the images. So the introduction: banana, as we know, banana is a globally consumed fruit and the fourth most important food crop in the world. Early harvest of banana may lack flavor and may not ripe properly. While harvesting it, may, it late may overripe the fruit. So the maturity of fruit is assessed by the by measures such as change of peel color from dark green to pale green, disappearance of angularity. finger length and diameter so banana can be classified into three categories unmature mature and overmature a uh, conventional method of assessing uh, conventional method of assessing of maturity was done previously by a person based on his vision and assess, uh, and the fruit was assessed by the color and agility uh, 
automatic detection system automated detection system uh, based on the camera and the computer based technology uh, has been widely explored the quality analysis and guiding of agriculture products this has proven a success uh, during this uh, years uh, ripening process is using seven uh, point scale so uh, there are seven uh, uh, scale to de uh, detect whether the fruit is ripe or uh, raw so the first scale uh, uh, green the uh, banana color will be green which is raw and then the scale two is green with uh, trace of yellow which is uh, in the process of uh, ripening so th this is uh, under mature process scale three more green than yellow uh, so it is still getting uh, ripened and scale uh, four more yellow than green so this is a uh, uh, matured uh, in the category of matured scale 5 green tip with yellow with yellow and scale 6 all yellow uh, this is uh, uh, and uh, scale 7 yellow flickered with brown which is um, over matured Uh, the methodology uh, sample collection so uh, the banana fresh fruit uh, branches can be uh, broadly classified into uh, three main categories namely under mature matured and over mature so it is considered to be uh, under mature if the age is uh, less than 12 weeks after flowering and the color is uh, green color and it is considered to be mature uh, if the uh, age is between 12 and 17 weeks and the color is pale green and it is considered to be over matured when the age is more than 17 weeks after flowering so the algorithm for mature classification as we can see in the figure how the flow will be first we will input image background removal and setting background region then the color value extraction size value extraction data analysis and the classification algorithm and then testing background removal so we uh, now based on the image we have to remove the background and just uh, uh, get the uh, proper image of the background. the background was removed from the image using the threshold value and convert it into rgb which is red green blue image into binary image converted the binary image uh, uh, has zeros as the banana region and one in the background region as shown in the figure extracting a banana region uh, the banana image was con uh, converted into the complement of uh, ones uh, the banana region uh, and zeros as the background uh, complement image was used to identify the boundaries of the banana region the size value section so next phase after after that is uh, to get the size value as we know size of the banana is second important feature in determining the maturity level of the banana so we consider the length and width of the banana, uh, which can be measured using the Pythagoras theorem. Here, the distance between two points uh, in the coordinate geometry is represented by the formula distance, which is equal to square root of uh, delta x square plus delta y square, where uh, delta x is equal to x x2 minus y y1, and delta y is equal to y2 minus y1. The intersection point of x x1 y1 and x2 y2 were considered for the distance measurement. The point of each calculate the sum of the length of the object from each side. Friend. Was used to compare the uh, significance of data, uh, color, mean, intense value, area, parameter, major, axis length, and my axis length. Classify algorithms. Uh, so we, we were thinking of developing from data set color and in intensity value and the and the area value. The data set will be analyzed using the box and whisker plot technique, where the where the where the data is uh, depicted uh, uh, from the group of numerical data through its quartet. So first figure we see the box and disk plot representation of main intensity value and second figure we see the box and disk plot representation of area value.
detection of maturity of banana the uh, maturity determination of banana was automated using the uh, guide which is the graphical user interface and uh, development environment uh, of matlab uh, the development algorithm in the image processing tool uh, of matlab lab was uh, linked to the guide the guide is user friendly and easy to use for the end users yeah friends thank you thank you Hi, this is Dharminder Raju. I am working as assistant professor, Department of Computer Science in Oxford College of Science. Today we are going to discuss about a research paper on data mining. So my research paper combines the educational data mining, learning trials, observation methods in order to better understand how students respond. to the educational software data mining is also known as the knowledge discovery in data we are calling in short form kddd it is used to extract useful data from the large set of any raw data but meaningful exact information now coming to what are the key research application fields where are the what are the fields available in data mining what are the various fields first one oracle data mining second one web mining third one data warehouse last one text mining etc etc these are the key research application fields why you need to outsource phd assistants why the phd people need assistants based on because we are discussing about in this one database data means very very useful it will work it will support in 24 by 7 that's why first one here unlimited revisions second one 24 by 7 admin support so i am telling here 24 by 7 how we are going to support admin uh, 24 by 7 means what are the platforms we are going to use to support means first one live chat second one customer care third one skype fourth one email these are the various uh, different platforms we are going to use to support the in 24 by 7 these are the main assistants because this is the database you are you need to support 24 by 7 these are the various fields we are going to use next one what are the different names that means alternative names are using for data mining so first one knowledge discovery in database or knowledge discovery data that is called kdd knowledge extraction business intelligence etc etc these are the alternative names for the data to so in data mining so many various classifications are mainly we are focusing on educational data mining so this short form edm educational data mining what are the overview of the educational data mining in emerging discipline concerned with the developing methods for exploring the unique and increasingly large scale data that can that come from educational settings using those methods to better understand the students and the settings which they learn in the past now coming to what are the classes of educational data mining methods is that first one prediction second one clustering third one relationship mining fourth one discovery with models discovery with models fifth one distinguishing of data for human judgment we are going to see one by one what is prediction what is clustering how it is useful these are the main classes of edm method edm stands for educational data mining mining coming to first one prediction suppose we want to develop a model which can interpret a single aspects of the data from some combination of other aspects of the data which students are of stock which students will fail the class by using the prediction we can analyze which students will get the fail mark which students will get the pass mark this are all we are going to learn this in the 
uh, prediction it will effort it will support for the analyzing of the data previously based on the prediction only we are going to decide this uh, so and so students will fail so and so we get the good marks based on prediction we are going to discuss this is useful for the prediction clustering find points that naturally group together splitting full data set into a set of clusters usually used when nothing is known about the structure of the data what behaviors are prominented in the domain what are the main groups of students this all are called clustering that means you are splitting full data into the set of clusters set of clusters relationship mining discover relationship between the variables in a data set with many variables association rule mining correlation mining sequential pattern mining causal data mining these are the relationships coming to discovery with models pre existing model developed with edi prediction methods or clustering or knowledge engineering Applied to data and used a component in another analysis. Another analysis. Next one, distillation of data for human judgment, making complex data understandable by humans to level the judgment. So, for example, you have complex data. The student or single user cannot able to understand how it will just means. For example, text replace or the simple example. For example, you have lot in um, GB of data, 5 GB, 10 GB, 50 GB of data. How it will do? You not not able to understand all the data at a time. So simply you are texting, simply you are sending the one query. You immediately will get to know. That's why text replace are the simple example. Of. Next one, Microsoft Excel is tool for exploring the data analysis and for the setting up simple models. So Excel is the wonderful tool for understand analyzing the data. data mainly why is this useful excellent tool i told for exploratory data analysis and for setting up simple models you can specify much more complex mathematical model than this and much more quickly they can have implement the software for example excel is usually where i test variants on bayesian knowledge tracing before implementing the java before implementing java where you get your data from means you will need to process it the data from the software can easily analyze which build useful common approach flawed data file even if you store your data in database most data mining techniques require flawed data file like the one we looked into the x finally i conclude my research paper this paper surveyed the most relevant studies carried out in the field of educational data mining including the data used in certain studies and the methodologies methodologies it also defined the most common task used in the educational data mining as well as those that are the most promising for the future thank you thanks for giving this one my project is face recognition what is face recognition face recognition is the task of identifying an already detected face as a known or unknown face and in more advanced it will tell exactly whose it is and to send an alert message to the cloud if it detects a unknown face to create a complete project on face recognition we must work on three phases data set generator or creator trainer and detector so to create the face recognition program first we need to install python 3.6 ideally in our system then install open cv library that is cv2 library using the command prompt data set creator so before starting with the data set creator first we need to create a folder name data set in the same location where we are going to save our programs that is our dot py scripts then we need to download the cascade classifier object that is har cascade frontal face default.xml which already contains many pre-trained classifiers for face eyes smile etc those xml files 
can be downloaded from har cascade directory and that xml file must be saved in the same directory where we created our dataset folder so below is the picture how we have saved our dataset folder and the uh, har cascade frontal face default default dot file our dataset creator is going to capture the sample faces of one person from a live video file and assign a id to it and it will save those samples in a folder named dataset we are go we are doing this to make sure that sample images don't mixed up with other persons image samples so our captured images is going to save like this user dot id dot sample number dot jpg id which we are going to give id number can be anything zero one whichever number you are giving that is going to save as id sample number suppose the video is capturing twenty samples uh, sample number can be anything from zero to twenty so for example if the user id is one and it's fifth sample from the sample list then the file name will be user dot one dot five dot jpg why this format we can easily get which user's face it is from its file name while loading the image for training the recognizer. This picture is going to give clear idea on what is dataset creator. So here in this dataset creator, the video, the live video is going to capture a few samples of our face, and those samples are uh, going to save in the dataset folder. Trainer. Now we have to train the recognizer to learn faces from the data set so for that we need a trainer so to do that create a python trainer.py file in the same folder where we saved our data set creator script and then create a folder in the same directory name it trainer so this is how we are going to save the folders and inside the trainer it is going to create a trainer.yml file train the recognizer train trainer is going to train the recognizer means it is going to differentiate the two different faces with their ids which are saved in the dataset folder detector in the previous part we learned to train a recognizer using a dataset now in this part we are loading recognizer to see how we can use that recognizer to recognize faces and tell exactly who it is and it will send a message to the cloud if it detects an unknown face so for that we need cloud mqtt cloud mqtt uh, uh, which provides a lightweight method of carrying out messaging using a publish or subscribe message queuing model so below is the picture um, producer or a publish which will send a message through the broker broker is our cloud mqtt and the consumer or the subscriber is going to receive the message so here you can see uh, suppose if the input is a temperature sensor and it is sending uh, 25 degrees celsius as the message through the cloud mqtt broker and the mobile and the laptop will behave like a subscriber and it is going these two going to receive the message as 25 degree celsius so for that first we need to create our account in cloud mqtt create an instance go to details and note down the user id password and port number uh, that will be needed in the coding part uh, to get the connection go to web socket and keep it connected recognition or detector so recognizer is going to detect our faces using the trainer.yml file which is in the trainer and it will exactly tell who it is and it will send a message to the cloud if it detects an unknown face so this is the overall project dataset creator trainer and the recognizer or detector so this is the final output when it detects my face it will tell uh, who i am so it is printing lavanya when it detects unknown face uh, it will tell it is unknown person and it will send a message th through the cloud like a unknown person is trying to access your system see when it detects a unknown person it is sending a message it will continuously send a message to the cloud a message is like unknown person is trying to access your system so that's all about the project thank you
So myself, uh, Ram Krishna Reddy B. My paper presentation on enhanced transmission MAC protocol for wireless network. So my abstract is here. So I used a new pro MAC protocol that is medium access control protocol called continuous enhanced transmission for wireless network. This proposed protocol is based on carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance, that is CSMA or CA, but we have enhanced the acknowledgement packet and re-architectured mobile station's behavior so that they could continuously transmit data without congestion. Our proposed algorithm tries to keep collision in the network as low as possibly by allowing wireless stations to form a sequence of transmission among stations that have data to send. The results are analyzed and compared with simulations. The model of the analysis is quite uh, accurate in predicting network throughput. So here, medium access control protocol is uh, one of the fundamental parts of the telecommunication system. In multiple access systems, a large number of users share a common communication channel to transmit information to a receiver. Medium access control schemes are used to control the access of active nodes to the shared channel. In wireless communications networks, MAC schemes can significantly affect the overall performance of the network systems. In recent years, much interest has been involved in studying 802.11 BCF, that is Distributed Coordination Function Protocol, for WLAN, that is wireless LANs, such as 802.11 BCF protocol. It is a fundamental access method used to support asynchronous data transfer on a best effort basis. As identified in the specification, all stations must support the DCF. This is a random access scheme based on the carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance protocol. Because sending station cannot detect collision by hearing its own transmission, CSMA or CA employs a positive acknowledgement which is sent by receiving a station to indicate the successful transmission. So I used here the proposed protocol for continuous assisted transmission protocol. So here all the stations have some information of other stations in their communication ranges in order for other stations to actively involve in the cooperation process. Acknowledgement packet is redesigned by adding a new field with a size of 6 objects. This newly added field is enough to contain another address. We should point out here that the modified ACK frame, acknowledgement frame, a method should be developed in order to differentiate those frames, such as sequence of bits is added as an identifier to those frames. Thank you. So let me tell you what is big data big data so big data it is a huge collection of data in order to perform the online transaction as well as any web applications the collection of huge data the concept can be used big data the areas of use where big data can be applied comes under health policies human robotics or any social any business organization where huge amount of data has to be stored in all those situations big data can be applied the basic technique used behind big data can be data mining visualize data mining and visualization data computing and data management data integration data extraction all these all these tasks which are applied in different areas like online shopping, smart cities, health, in whichever area big data has been applied by keeping the by following the policies for protection and security of data, data mining and visualization tools has been applied and the view is given for the user in well advanced manner. These are few organizations that is providing tools for applying big data. 
big data analysis in order to perform the analysis in order to perform the task like data mining and data management there are few tools and the tools provided by different organizations are given here in this slide since big data is operating on large collection of data a team work is required and new concepts new algorithms implementing new algorithms new methodologies systems and applications in big data is the hypothesis that we are putting forward into this paper hi all i'm pratibha nayar here to talk about my work on data hiding using integer wavelet transform Data, data security has always been one of the most challenging areas in the digital era. In data hiding, a secret message is hidden in a cover image such that no one apart from the sender and the intended recipient have knowledge about the existence of the message. Because of this, it has wide application in military and medical fields. In lossless data hiding, the marked media can be reversed to the original cover media without any distortion. image quality payload and reversibility are the general criteria of data hiding it can be done using spatial or transform domain techniques but because of the robustness transform domain techniques are found to be more useful in many applications such as data hiding in the present work integer wavelet transform is used for embedding data in a cover the diagram shows the time frequency resolutions of different transformations the size and orientation of the blocks indicate how small the features are that can be distributed in time and frequency domain the original time series has a high resolution in time domain and zero resolution in frequency domain that means we can distinguish very small features in time domain but no features in frequency domain to the contrary frequency domain has a high resolution in frequency domain and zero resolution in the time domain The short time Fourier transform has medium sized resolution in both the frequency as well as time domain whereas the wavelet transform has for its small frequency values a high resolution in frequency domain and low resolution in time domain and for large frequency values a low resolution in frequency domain and high resolution in time domain integer wavelet transform is an invertible integer to integer wavelet analysis algorithm which can be used for applications that are required to produce integer coefficients for integer encoded signals compared with other transforming techniques iwt is computationally faster and more memory efficient and are found to be more suitable in lossless data compression applications by using iwt the integer signal can be perfectly reconstructed from the computer computed integer the diagram shows data hiding using integer wavelet transforms here single double single level decomposition is applied to the cover image using iwt and data is embedded in high frequency subbands that is lh hk and hh as they have less visible artifacts in human eyes then combined high frequency subbands to make an image coefficient mark image is thus obtained by performing inverse iwt here an input image along with the secret data and the threshold is chosen first level 1 integer wavelet transform is applied on the cover image and the approximation and the detailed subbands that is hl lh and hh are obtained combine the three high frequency subbands to make a new image coefficient secret data is hidden on the detail subbands of the cover image using threshold based histogram shifting on the new image coefficient intermediate marked image is obtained by performing the 1d inverse integer wavelet transform on the original approximation subband and the modified detail subbands now we we'll let us see the data extraction level 1 integer wavelet transform is applied on the marked image to obtain the approximation as well as modified detail subbands the three modified high frequency subbands are combined to make a new coefficient image coefficient 
extract the secret data from the new image coefficient using threshold based histogram shifting and restore the original detailed subband coefficient image. After the data extraction, separate the restored coefficient image into three equal subbands. Again, the cover image is restored by performing the inverse integer wavelet transform on the originally approximation subband and the restored detailed subbands. The testing was carried out on different images and simulation is performed using MATLAB 2015. Here we can see the Lena image, original as well as and and this is a medical image. Data hiding algorithm is applied to many typical grayscale images and medical images and the results were found to be satisfactory. And the table below shows the experimental results with PSNR as well as payload for. With the proposed method to hide digital data using integer wavelet transform, Cover image as well as the hidden data is recovered without much distortion. The quality of the marked image and the payload are found to be good from the experiment. Thank you. Hi all. We came to the end of the conference. The mind is not a vessel to be built, but a fire to be ignited. It was said by Plutarch. At the valedictory function, I, Dr. Gopal Reddy NV, the organizing secretary, delighted to present the report on the two days international web conference in East 2020, organized by the R&D cell, the Oxford College of Science, Bangalore. More than 90 oral presentations were presented on our two days international web conference in East 2020. On the first day of the technical session, we had Dr. Arun Mohan Islur, Professor and Head of the Department of Chemistry, NITK Suratkal. He explained about the removal of the toxic dyes from the wastewater and industrial effluents, which are the major challenges in the environmental pollution. The second speaker of the day, Dr. Pinky Day, Research Associate, University of New South Wales, Sydney, Australia put forward her research findings that the extensive kinetic study of the binding energy analysis of the protein that bind to the DNA by using computer simulations. The third speaker of the day, Dr. Anuradha Ramoji, Professor, Institute of Physical Chemistry, Friedrich Siller University, Germany, spoke about the applications of Raman spectroscopy for biomedical analysis. On the second day, Dr. Anupam Raina, postdoctoral researcher, University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, USA, explained the reprogramming neurons and understanding Parkinson's disease at the cellular and molecular level. The last speaker, Mr. Satyajana, Senior Director, Cloudman, VMware USA, discussed on the modern cloud architecture and its application in various fields. It is my great pleasure to thank our beloved chairman, C. S. N. V. L. Narasimha Raju, the Oxford Educational Institutions, the chairperson of the organizing committee, Principal Dr. R. Kaveshri, for being a catalyst in the organizing the MIST 2020. I would like to thank the conveners, Dr. S. Bharti and Professor Gayatri Sudhir, for their encouragement and motivation for guiding throughout for the smooth conduct of this conference. My heartfelt thanks to our amazing committee members and my special thanks to Mr. Prakash for technical support who, who helped in smooth conduct of MIST 2020. I thank each and everyone who have participated in the international web conference MIST 2020 and made it successful. Thank you all. I request you all to join, the, join with us for not a geek.
Please fill the uh, feedback form, which I shared in chat box, as well as in the WhatsApp group. Session will be going to end.